Hey, right, what's up? What's up? What's up, everybody? Welcome Monday night. It is uh, Raw Sessions right here on Jiggy John TV, and I've got my man in Baraj in the house. What's up, buddy? Hey, what's up? All right. So if you guys are just joining us, just be feel free to jump on the stream. We've decided to do something a little different uh, just for fun today and discuss something that ironically uh, both of us uh, kind of PM the P for a while to talk about something that we realize has been uh, happening uh, rather uh, in full throttle uh, recently ever since everyone's been cooped up at home. So do you want to let me just share with you who my guest is first of all. Uh, for those of you who will be wondering, how come suddenly there's someone uh, brand new who I'm hosting with, or at least uh, having on the show with me? And Not a celebrity. I please, laddie. Uh, usually your shows only have celebrities, you know, so <laughs> I might be a very unknown face. <laughs> Sad up. All right, so uh, Imbaraj does a couple of things, but I think uh, your main gig now is Pixar Works. Am I correct? Yeah, that's the main business. I run a creative agency. Okay. So that's where uh, I make most of my money to pay my bills. Uh, and then where it allows me, where I have the flexibility, I do a lot of other things for fun. <laughs> uh, may or may not make money, but you know, sometimes you have to do a variety of things to keep going, right? Can't do the same thing. Of course, of course. So, I mean, let's just make sure that folks know that we are doing this. And uh, obviously we're gonna spur as much con uh Yeah, I'm just trying to share the right link. Because I yeah. keep getting the wrong link from the site, so I keep a, <laughs> now I think the right yeah. link. Now we're good. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure we're good now. Anyways, so I mean, one of the things that we both uh, came across recently was um, the fact that, at least on my timeline, I've suddenly been inundated with uh, offerings of all sorts of uh, experts uh, suddenly offering their expertise in the form of, I mean, the the word to use here masterclass actually came about from the original masterclass series which is out of san francisco and yeah. and, and those guys i think have been running since uh, if i'm not wrong it's 2000 and let me see let me get my facts right masterclass has been around since 2000 and anyways 2015 2005 right so anyways long story short so now everybody all around the world is also jumping on the bandwagon but yeah. more importantly, is in this neck of the woods, like, you know. So uh, I think that's where I started to question this whole, hmm. I mean, I can literally think of true, true blue experts who probably have uh, the right to get out there and, and suddenly say that they are now offering, a, uh, you know, a little special course like this. But uh, what, what actually stifles me is, Suddenly, it's like every Tom, Dick, and Harry is an uh, expert. Lah. What's up, Mark Merrill Lee? Do you know him? Uh? Hey, Mark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just uh, chatting with him earlier today. <laughs> he's actually my schoolmate. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, but I'm not I mean, in the, the same industry, so. Ah. But he's like, a th he's like a taiko. I'm like a you know, no, small no, fry. So. He, he's a big timer. Lah, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you, you, you can sign our back later, Mark. So, I mean, <laughs> I think the conversation here was just to spur. Uh, just to spur, uh, I, I guess, uh, a bit of uh, the online sphere, what their thoughts were on this. And, and Mark, you're welcome to jump in the fray as well. Uh, I mean, I think I saw you mention this as well, in Baraj, but what's your, what's your take? I mean, how's it been for you uh, with regards to pre-MCO and post-MCO with regards to this conversation that we are, we're talking about here? Yeah, so, uh, sorry, hold on. Uh. Okay, so the thing is, online trainers have always been there, right? The internet yeah. gurus, the online gurus, uh, offering all kinds of trainings. They've always been there. But it's just that now with the MCO, uh, while yeah. everybody else who's going online, these guys who are already online are basically just going over, over, overdrive, right? They are on overdrive now. They were all, already there, mm. unlike the rest of the world. Yeah. But now they feel like they have to do more. So which is why suddenly we are noticing them everywhere. You're right. So previously, they were just there around, not too uh, disruptive. Uh, they were not bugging too many people, mm. but now it's just everywhere. But the thing is, see, I don't have anything against uh, training, right? Training, yeah. online training, whether it's online, I mean, education is just a natural uh, evolution to education, right? You take it online to all yeah. kinds of, like everything else, everything yeah. else is going online. Yeah. Uh, digital transformation is here. So naturally trainings have to go online. Uh, but what I don't really understand is when 
any but like you said right any tom and dick harry any tom dick and harry now can train uh, so what are the credentials when you go to mm-hmm. university obviously you know you have lecturers and then you start looking at them are they masters lecturers or phd lecturers even there's a different level right yeah. when you have a lecturer who has a phd or is a professor you look at them differently and then you have a lecturer who only has masters you look at them differently of yeah. course you know that's it's just a way of us to gauge whether they may be good or not but it's right. not a guarantee but now online somebody who's 15 years old can suddenly be a internet guru and you know teaching things to other people yeah uh, so that's the thing uh, i see there are a lot of uh, uh, very deceptive ways in marketing so what i don't see is substance so that's when it it gets a bit annoying uh, when too many people claim that they can train you in this and that and they want to charge you a lot of money and they're very good at marketing themselves so yeah. naturally a lot of people end up paying money yeah and then when they come out of it they feel like they feel cheated a bit because we get the feedback right yeah uh, although i personally have been uh, you know i haven't spent any money on these kind of trainings yet yeah uh, but i have a lot of uh, i know a lot of people who have spent money on this kind of online trainings yeah. and then when they come out of it uh, they feel a bit cheated yeah so they feel like there's no substance so uh, i mean yeah sorry go, finish up yeah go ahead go ahead so that's, no, I, that's I what think i'm saying the the reason why uh, you know I, I i realized that i saw you talk about it and i was like you know what this is actually a good conversation to spur and spar with online uh, yeah. and and as as you said for me education is a lifelong process you never stop learning and I'm, oh, I'm i'm all for this i'm all for people upskilling themselves i'm all for people especially now that we are at home uh, some of us have more time on our hands some don't uh, especially those with families suddenly you realize that whoa taking care of work is going to be a lot difficult when at any point in time your bvip which is your child can rock up to your lap case in point your daughter your princess was with you just seconds ago and you know yeah. and, now, and now you're working right so yeah. um, i think what has bothered me is with regards to uh, i mean the everyday layman are they are they falling uh, victim to just uh, damn good advertising and damn good marketing uh, but in reality yeah how do you gauge if of some of these trainers or or what not i mean for me instance i mean i've hired uh, speakers motivators trainers mm-hmm. and and they come with this whole bag of credentials now half the time the paper uh is is the proof that okay lah they are bringing that to the table right and yes of course then they've got these videos and 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 that alone tells you that these dudes these ladies these men they are bringing the correct uh, amount of knowledge and experience to the table so you know that's like okay you you know what you're getting lah but currently i think um there seems to be this bit of an overload and over uh, uh, overdose i guess of uh, a lot of people who are suddenly overnight experts lah and i mean i'm not naming anyone i'm not shaming anyone and i personally know of those who are probably long overdue in doing it but they don't even do it and then there are those who are now coming online with it and in fact i know of a dear friend who's doing it and you know ironically just before we did this I, when i posted that we were going to do this i mean i shared it and i i i, I messaged his friend and i said don't worry it's not in reference to you because i say first of all you have my vouch i, I vouch for you you know like you know you've got my vote and that, that person just laughed it off I, but you know so this is where i'm coming from like say when i speak of this for instance this person this person has enough track record and the credentials yep. that anyone is jumping on it like even another gentleman who uh, you know i i've been doing some of these streams with he recently posted that last week and and that took over the internet and and mm. so you know when when you are a leading expert or you are a voice to reckon with and then you offer uh suddenly this offering obviously people are going to jump uh, because i saw this particular person who mentioned and i saw it i think it was on your page or at least you were in the conversation of how this uh, there was a particular online training or online sharing and 15 minutes later young dipertuan was nowhere to be found lah you know yeah. every, everybody is waiting and i think i think that's not right right i mean so for me it's like if you're going to do this make sure you treat this as a typical professional training course that and so for me that set my wheels in motion that this is where every tom dick and harry assumes that uh they are now an online trainer lah in fact this joker arvin patmaraja can probably do uh, a ton of training he can talk till the cows come home and then some you know yeah definitely definitely i use him as a trainer for some of my programs as well oh you know arvin i i can't jump in that's what i'm saying right you know this einstein <laughs> this is what we call einstein lah you know so sure. so the point is i mean there's a lot of people right now who are hungry to yeah. upskill themselves and learn 
Yes. And, and, and the purpose of our conversation here, and I'm more than happy to actually have these two gentlemen join the stream if they want to. If you two homeboys are free as birds and have a good connection at home, let me know and I'll share you the stream link. Jump in. We are welcoming the panel and I think you two are as good as you get with the panel. Uh, that is Mark is there, still there and Arvid. Um, you know, so I feel that it's not right that um, there, there's a lot of our everyday friends who are actually falling victim to some of these adverse advertising tactics. Like, I mean, I literally opened up my my IG this morning and when I, I was scrolling through IG stories in between, was well, suddenly this champion lah, offering his services and I'm like, what the bloody hell? Like, it was, it's also it's just that you're spying on our conversation, you know? <laughs> you know, yeah, probably it's the keyword, uh, you know, marketing. No, but this is where yeah. I wonder about this whole data mining process. And actually, the correct person will be Mark Darren. He's the ultimate fisherman, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> to, to tell us how this works. But you know, so I mean, what has been your 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 take? So I, I think I think it's 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 you got it on point earlier when you said marketing, right? Yeah. So I think a lot of them are just really good at marketing. But the the keyword that I want to focus is substance. Yeah. So when you want to learn something from someone. So whether it's theoretical or, or or from experience, I mean not. I mean a lot of people like to say those who can't do uh, teach and all that. I mean yeah. I don't agree with that. I mean yeah. a lot of teachers and yeah. you know lecturers and all that. I mean they teach mostly from theoretical knowledge. Yeah. They don't necessarily have industry experience, but they're really yeah. good at. It. I mean they're yeah. very good at what they do at yeah. teaching and training other people. Yeah. So that's fine. Yeah. Uh, but you know even that even though if you're purely based on theoretical knowledge, there still must be substance. Like right. the content itself. So if you are creating a training program mm. and the module itself, the, the training program itself has no substance, yeah. then you're just, you know, trying to just basically make money out of nothing. Like, you know, just very good marketing, just throw in some rubbish content out there yeah. and then just try to make money. I think also because probably many of them learn this through some other training programs. Because if you yeah. notice, many of them have the same pattern, right? Yeah. From the way they market their programs, uh, the way they design their posters, uh, the keywords that they use, it's yep. very similar. So that means they went and probably joined some other training that teaches them how to do training. Yep. And then they just kind of repeat the whole process. So there's no substance to the actual content there. So it's just about the process. And leading on to that, that literally that's a root word right there, substance. For yeah. me, if I am going to gauge if somebody has substance, I want to know your credentials and your track record. So yep. I think if anyone's going to put their, put themselves out there or if anyone's going to sign up for something, the the very least you should do is just go and do a, you know, I mean, if that person isn't already the who's who and a so-and-so who doesn't need any further introduction, then well and good. <laughs> there you go. The yeah. beauty of working from home, you know, your, yeah. <laughs> your studio in tech. Um, no, uh, but my I kids think, went to sleep and then suddenly they're out again. Oh, no. <laughs> they, they, want, they are all influencers. La, so they are following after father's yeah. footsteps. Oh, see, go you know? No, but I think what's important here is actually to be able to pick the best or the most useful trainers out there, right? There's right. so many trainers out there. So knowledge and experience are very they're equally important. So especially for training programs, like for me, I get very annoyed when people teach entrepreneurship, right? Because yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are so many non-entrepreneurs teaching entrepreneurship nowadays. Right. I mean, I, I won't say it's totally wrong, but yeah. I'm still a bit 50-50 on this, right? Right. Uh, so if you compare with the uh, formal education, we are in university or school and all that, we don't have a choice. Right. So we, we take whatever we get. But now, when we're out there e-learning, we're on our own trying to uh, get all this knowledge, we actually yeah. have a choice. Yeah. So if you can pick a lecturer who's you know 100% based on theoretical knowledge, or you get to pick a lecturer with theoretical knowledge and also industry experience, who would you pick? Correct. Right. So yeah. it, it's a it's a no-brainer, right? So now when we're out here e-learning, uh, we have all this choice. So why would you learn entrepreneurship? from someone who has never done entrepreneurship, for example, right? That's correct. Uh, so those are the things I think we can look at. But for most people, it's very easy for them to fall to good marketing, right? Especially when the marketing is designed to brainwash people. I mean, this is not rocket science, right? Brainwashing people has always been there. Uh, if you look at a lot of the MLM businesses, that's how they work. You know, they invite yeah. you for a preview, for a meeting, uh, and then they have all these things. I mean, the moment you walk into a building, you see yeah. two Ferraris parked outside. Correct. I mean, that's the whole brainwashing starts from there. Right on. Uh, so there's a right process, on. right? So it's a very cleverly thought of process. Yeah. Uh, from the way the suits that they wear, although it's probably rental and the cars are probably rental. Yeah. Uh, but they create that that image, mm -hmm. which kind of brainwashes you. And by the time they get to the plans and say, hey, put in $10,000 into this business, you are ready. <laughs> you just sign that money away. Yeah. So although, you know, Maybe it's legal, but to me, it's very unethical. 
And right. I feel like many of these online internet gurus have kind of brought that practice into here. That's right. that's what I feel. Because right. I've always been very anti of this MLM businesses, right? Right. Uh, I mean, of course, there are different levels, uh, multi-level marketing, uh, direct sales and all that. Yep. But many of the very, you know, like the bullshit investment, uh, cash-based uh, MLM businesses, they basically just take your money and run with it. Uh, I'm very anti. And I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, lives ruined. Friends have lost a lot of money. Uh, career, even their families over these kind of businesses. So I, I'm very anti that and I always discourage, I openly discourage people from joining these kind of businesses. I don't even give them the 50-50, right? I'm like, don't be stupid. Don't put your money into this. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm very vocal about that. So when I see those kind of patterns and practices brought into this kind of online, you know, internet trainings, mm -hmm. I kind of see that, that, that same style. I'm like, okay, now this is all about bullshit marketing yeah. to brainwash people because it might be a free webinar, uh -huh. Or it can be, you know, just a 20 ringgit webinar. The, so the moment you go in, the entire thing becomes a sales pitch. That right. means that webinar or whatever you signed up yeah. does not give you any substance. Yeah. You don't take away anything from that few hours of your day, right? Right. That few hours of your life gone. Because that entire thing is basically just a sales pitch for you yeah. to now sign up for the bigger packages. Correct. Uh, so, and if you don't do that, you go home with nothing. Uh, and if you even take that that bigger package, you might also still go back with nothing because they don't really have a lot of substance there either, right? It's just a way to convince you to part with your money. And then after that, you'll probably never be able to catch that trainer on Skype. They'll be unavailable for the next 12 months. Uh, that's how a lot of them make money, right? They promise you 12 you know, Skype sessions for exactly. one to one mentorship coaching. We've exactly. seen that. I mean, I've seen a lot of people losing money like that. Uh, and then, but the next 12 months, they won't be available. They'll be too busy and you'll be like, oh, okay, maybe they're too busy, right? But you've already paid them upfront. Correct. Uh, so those are the kind of things that I'm a bit, uh, you know. So that's why for me, kind of that. you kind of took the words out of my mouth in the sense of if mm -hmm. you actually realize a lot of them, when they market themselves, my God, they are promising you the sun, the moon and the stars. You're going to become a, a sensation overnight. You know, it's a get almost like a too good to be believed, uh, too good to be believed scenario where for, it's borderline get rich quick scheme, you know. And yeah, it, it, it comes from that. But then when I look at, I, I come back to Masterclass, Masterclass, the one that, you know, that, that actual platform that is out there. Yeah. And, and this is what they say, you know, like Masterclass is supposed to be an online le learning platform where the world's most successful people teach you the things that made them successful. So here, yeah. herein lies the question and the answer. If you're going to be yeah. signing up for such, such a thing, you want to actually ask yourself, is the person who's, you know, conducting it or offering you this option to change your life, are they are they really the Bill Gates of their industry, like, you know, yeah. or or are, are they known to be just revolutionary in that in that sense? And have they really made a difference that they are now suddenly the who's who uh, to 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 speak their point of view and and you become a willing buyer, willing seller in this scenario? So yeah. you know, because I so think to, to me. To me, I feel actually anyone can bring substance. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to be the, you know, Gordon Ramsay or Bill yeah. Gates of the world. Yeah. But for them, it, they're at a different level, right? Yeah. They're more to inspiring people. Yeah. You, you know, you can watch 100 videos of Gordon Ramsay cooking. You might yeah. never follow the exact recipe, yeah. but you might be inspired to cook now, right? Right. Uh, that's, they're at a different level. You just watch them and they're just inspiring. But there are other people who may not be as famous and all that. Yeah. But they can still bring a lot of substance in terms of the content, uh, whatever they put together. It yeah. could be things that you can find uh, free on the internet. Yeah. But if you have taken the time to do the research, bring in yeah. the best material, compile yeah. it into a module and create a course, yeah. I think that has a lot of value. And if it has a lot of practical knowledge, right? I mean, if I go through a three days program on digital marketing and then I come out of that and now I'm able to set up a Facebook page and create uh, you know, an yeah. online presence for my business and run Facebook ads, and get leads. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of value to that. I mean, I don't need, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg to teach me that, right? Fair uh, enough. So <laughs> someone like me or someone who's, you know, better than me can teach me that. But sure. uh, but if I go sign up a whole program like that, which promises me that, yeah. But then when I go through the program, there's no substance. Uh, that's when it becomes very disappointing. So but the, the, usually the marketing is, you know, full of promises, right? Correct. And then so, when you go through the program, there's no substance. So this is where I would say, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, or at least let me know your point of view. I think it's almost possible to trust your gut with regards to these promo videos out there. Because if you know somebody is just a salesman, they're just doing a sales pitch, like, you know, and are they genuine? Are they really going to teach you something? Because when I look at some of these videos that have popped up on my timeline, I'm like, this is full-blown... Full 
car salesman mode lah, you know. You know, <laughs> snake and, oil. yeah, snake oil salesman. <laughs> you know, so you kind of know that from just the hard sell uh, angle, the 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 pitch, and suddenly like you know, if you don't do it now, you're gonna miss this golden opportunity. I'm like, hey, go and fly kites lah. You know, I mean, that is just I. That's where I, for me, those are where alarm bells start to set off. I mean, coming back to how people actually just uh, are falling prey to some of these uh, amazing options are uh, currently suddenly a flush online now. You know, yeah. I think that's where you can actually, even given from their initial sales page, you can know if someone is genuine. Because when somebody puts out a video and says, uh, "I'm here to impart." The knowledge that I have garnered over the years, you can tell if they are legit, or if they're just blowing sunshine up your ass, lah. You know. Well, I think it's very easy to do some research, right? Just Google up their names and see their credibility. I mean, if you're genuinely a trainer or you've been uh, in the industry, your name will pop up here and there, right? Correct. Uh, you would have been, you know, you would have spoken at some conferences. You would have been invited to do certain, you know, training programs here and there. You would have done some, you know, uh, yep. programs for some big clients. So, it's it's not that difficult, but Correct. if you look at many of these online gurus, if you yep. look at uh, their, even their portfolio, yeah, there's not there's nothing much, uh, and the testimonials are usually from their own students, right? And you know, it's a it's a very popular uh, method as well. So when you most of these internet gurus, they give you discounts for testimonials. Mm. So when the students come, it's part of the program itself. Uh, so hey, you join, you pay this much, but if you give us a video testimonial, then you pay half or something like that. Correct. So, it is part of the, the the system that they use. Yeah. So all those who are testimonials you see on their own landing page yeah. are usually fake, right? I mean, if someone does a training for the first time and they already have ten testimonials, you have to wonder what's going on there. Correct. Uh, you know, this is the first time you're doing this training, first time ever in the world, but you have like you know, testimonials already. Uh, but you know, people still fall for it. Sometimes Correct. things are you know, the the bell should ring, the alarm bell should ring, but. Some for some people it just doesn't click right. They're like, oh, okay, looks legit. So they sign up. They spend a lot of money. To me, there's nothing wrong with uh, doing this online training if mm -hmm. you have the substance and Correct. you want to share with people Correct. and you want to charge accordingly. Yeah. Uh, it's only sad when the people who don't have that substance end up kind of unethically making all that money mm. uh, and kind of give a bad name to the rest of the industry as well. Yeah. So Correct. I know a lot of genuine trainers now who kind of feel a bit, you know, they're kind of mm. shy to promote themselves. Because yep. they feel like, hey, if I go all out too loud to promote my my training programs, I kind of end up looking like some of these very scammy people who are, you know, promoting their programs and spamming people. Correct. So they kind of, so the the genuine ones end up taking a step back. Yeah. Because they don't want to seen as the, you know, same as these guys. But the ones who are going all out to, you know, just grab your money, they are, on you know, full <laughs> full turbo mode. They're not stopping. It's interesting uh, because that's actually applicable to every single industry that's out there. I mean, uh, for those of us who are self-employed or you do your own thing, it's always a case of survival of the fittest, right? So mm -hmm. it, it seems to be now in full full bloom uh, with, with this whole internet um, internet trainers, internet-based trainers and all of that. So, And I think that's exactly what's happening where these guys are in full force uh, because, you know, for whatever it is, it's... Uh, it's a numbers thing and you know so for them as you said you know i mean the more uh, view, uh, the no people have gone through their program it makes it more legit but in reality is it you know this is where i think there should almost be a, a form of a way that we can scrutinize and uh, actually ah, there we go it's a trump effect huh? the loudest and most thick-skinned people in the world will be able to charge the most and get the largest crowd yeah it's true <laughs> But that is absolutely exactly what is going on. Yeah, yeah. It's a case of, uh, I hate to say this, but empty vessels making the most noise, lah, you know? Mm. Uh, but, but you know, in, in marketing, it's really that, right? I mean, it's, it's all about uh, making a, a big, loud noise and, and just riding off that initial big bang. And so yeah. now during yeah. MCO, yeah. there's been this big bang. Like suddenly it's like overdrive, you know, because everybody's at home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know? But so, you see, you can't blame them. Yeah. You can't blame them for trying, right? No, no, I mean, no. Everyone, no. Yeah. So everyone wants to make money. Everyone wants to. So even the genuine ones, the ones with substance, may end up using the same kind Correct. of deceptive methods to sign up people. Because you know, if they if they go with the actual program, right, they might not sign up anyone. So they Correct. might have to do certain you know tricks and uh, whatever that these other guys use just to get people to sign up. Uh, so yeah. which is fine to me. If you do some kind of marketing, you know, creative marketing, you know, yeah. to sign up people but you genuinely still want to give them that substance, yeah. then it's great. 
Uh, but for the rest who don't have that substance but just want to quickly make money, yep. you know, it's, for them it's just, just a quick grab and run. You can't blame them. I think it's perfectly fine for them to try to do that. I think it's on our, our side, right? As consumers, yes. uh, as knowledge seekers, we want to go and learn things. Yep. I think it's our responsibility to kind of kind of seek out the genuine ones, the ones with substance, uh, and try to learn from them. Uh, but the other thing that I want to say is, uh, see, uh, for someone like me, uh, most of the things I do now are all self-taught, right? Yep. Uh, I mean, you, you've been a events maestro for many years, uh, and you know, and I'm sure a lot of things you picked up along the way because many of these things you can't learn in a university or college, right? Right, right, uh, right. This comes from experience, doing the actual work, and you know, going online, reading a lot of materials. Yep. Uh, I mean, by training, I'm a remote sensing and GIS engineer. <laughs> I used to make satellite maps. Now I run a creative digital agency, right? right. I do websites, we build apps, I do social media marketing, uh, I do photography and video. So yeah. all these things uh, mostly are self-taught and yep. things I learn online. So you, if you actually put effort, you can go online and learn amazing things for free. Correct. Uh, there's so much of material out there, so much of content. Uh, but it's just that, you know, sometimes some people make it easier for you where they compile it into a program and they teach it for you with some kind of uh, extra substance, extra experience. So they can give you maybe, you know, uh, case studies, real life case studies to yep. make their learning a bit better, to enrich that learning experience. I think that's great. So for those kind of trainers who do that, I think that's amazing. Because uh, not everyone, you know, has the time to go just do their own research and Correct. find all these materials. Uh, but for those who can, yep. I mean, I would suggest, hey, do your own research. I mean, there's so much of information online that you can easily find. Uh, I mean, my entire knowledge on photography and videography from YouTube and, you know, earlier websites, now mainly YouTube because YouTube just makes it way more easier yep. to learn things. And you can professionally do a lot of things based on just things you learn online. Of course. So I think that's quite amazing. And, but yep. it's just that to me, as if you are into training, uh, I think you should take it seriously. Like you said earlier, right? You should take it seriously mm. as an, a profession, do it professionally, have some business ethics, you know, don't try to be deceptive, don't try to trick people. Uh, don't take people's money and don't give them substance. Yep. I mean, these are all business practices, right? There's nothing wrong with the business, but it's how you conduct the business. So if you have certain ethics in yourself on how you conduct your business, I think then you'll know what to do, the right things to do. So I think in, in summary, what we're actually saying here, and I think we, we, we just started this discussion was just to, to, to discuss what we've been noticing uh, that's happening, uh, you know, in, in large numbers recently. I think if any one of you is actually... Uh, First of all, we are saying, by all means, upskill yourself, number one. Uh, education is a lifelong process. You never stop learning. But we all agree that there's so much you can self-teach yourself online. And, and, and most of us are living proof of that. And if you're going to go to somebody uh, who's offering you this opportunity, a concise program or, or something that you think, the, li the, the least you can do, and you owe, your, you owe yourself that much, is to do your due diligence. Do a background check on this person. And you know, as Inbaraj, you mentioned, you know, I think to each and every one of you out there, if you're going to be upskilling yourself, just make sure you go and check that this person is everything they claim to be. If they are, are teaching you ways to get rich, what was their uh, success story? Uh, because, I mean, they cannot be just teaching you something they read in a book. And then and that's something we can all, you know, especially if it's along those lines. If they're teaching you the art of mechanical engineering, are they certified? Are they qualified for that? For instance, if they're, if they're going to teach them digital marketing. So I think to all the internet gurus out there, by all means, go out there and do your thing. We're not, we're not raining on your parade, not at all. But to anyone who wants to sign up, just make sure you actually know what you're signing up for. Because if you fall victim to a marketing ploy, then it's, it's really your own funeral. You know, it's, it's really a case of damn good marketeer and yeah. real dummy who fell for it because that's that's the essence of business i mean a lot of people will not accept that but business is really a case of the survival of the fittest and 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 a lot of times a lot of unscrupulous people take advantage of the situation amidst yeah. amidst a lot of genuine uh, genuine people and genuine in, uh, businesses with genuine intentions there's gonna always be you know these uh because businessmen yeah. usually it comes with a negative connotation if someone says I'm oh, but, see, but i can tell you one thing right if if we don't have ethics there's so many easy ways to make money right True. there's so many easy ways to deceive people into giving money correct it can be 100 percent legal correct. so it's just a matter of you want to do that or not so there's so many unethical marketing techniques out there yes uh, if i used all that i'll be way more richer right i have so much more money but you know i'm 
to me personally i i'm not a fan of that and okay. i also encourage my clients not to do that so even if my clients come to me and and suggest uh, all these you know shady uh, campaigns i tell yeah. them no yeah. I, i won't do that for you and i mean i can make money from that but yeah. i will not do that for you i would rather you go to somebody else uh, i mean as simple as buying a database to spam yeah i will never do that uh, because i hate spammers i hate gotcha. spam. i gotcha. i hate spammers so much but a lot of clients come to me and ask that right they're like mm. hey can i buy that do you know anywhere where we can buy a database of you know 10000 emails yeah. and let's spam this out i'm like no of course i know where to get it but yeah. i will never do that for you even though you're paying me a lot of money Understood. so i think as entrepreneurs we need to have some codes as well yeah uh, but if we don't have that then of course then we can sell anything right Snake i think oil, i think that's a, a com- that's a conversation for another day because you brought up yeah. a, a, when you said that as entrepreneurs i'm like yeah hold on here's another fellow entrepreneur and that makes another great conversation for another day and if you ask me that's a, that's a definitely a good conversation from ethics and 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 just entrepreneurship and all of that so any final words my friend because i didn't want to take out too much time on this and this is only keep it short and sweet any uh, plug think- anything you want to plug in here <laughs> uh not much to plug uh right now because uh i mean at the moment uh, i'm taking a break as well yeah. uh because you know on my side uh my business is still very much uh, physical uh, it's kind of half digital half physical so a lot of things are, are on hold so i'm taking this time off uh to also work on some other new ideas on the yeah. side and also i'm ca- i'm a bit busy now with my grocery aid project yeah so uh, i'm not sure whether you're aware we started this uh program to crowdfund money Uh, okay. to buy groceries for families that lost income during the mco uh, okay. so because initially when it started i kind of started hearing these stories that in the first week people had no food on the on the table right okay. so there are a lot of people who work on uh, day 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 uh, wage earners okay. they basically go out to work like cleaners your plumbers your electricians they go how out to work they get money and that's their day's food right how do you spell so, it so i can just put a little uh, crawler here uh, it's called grocery aid uh, you can see it on my page uh, on my personal aid. page uh, Yeah, grocery aid. Aid A I D or the aid? Yeah, A A I D. So okay. grocery aid. Uh so yeah. I call it COVID-19 grocery aid. There's a event page under my my fan page. Okay. Uh we are actually doing a crowdfunding on Pitchin. Okay. And we have raised uh, 18,000 so far, more than 18,000. Yep. Uh and we have already sent out 140 packs so far to about 100 almost 115 families I think. Very so nice. what we do is uh, we send uh, people uh, uh grocery pack worth 100 ringgit. Yep. which kind of lasts for about one to two weeks if they stretch it. Yep. But if they have more than five people in the family, we send them two packs. So we have started it, I think, uh, about middle of last month, and we've done three rounds of deliveries, and now okay. we're working on the fourth batch. So we're still actively raising money because the money is running out soon. Uh, I mean, 18,000, we can help 180 packages, right? So probably about 150 families. Uh, but there's so many people out there who are now really uh, uh, very tight because... Imagine for two almost two months you have no income at all. Yeah. And you've been earning a sort of income where you probably don't have any savings. I'm sure you know you are pretty much earning day to day and you're depending on that. Yeah. So many of them are uh, in very serious trouble. They got no diapers, no milk powders for their kids. Yeah. And the babies are drinking plain water. Uh, and so you know it's I'm kind of been a bit focused on that. So I thought you know what instead of working on my own business ideas i'm just going to focus on this for a while yeah. uh, let it up and running and then i can maybe work on other things on my own so far i've been a bit focused on that so which is why i don't have anything else to plug so just uh, to just to uh, reiterate your pe- anyone's welcome to chip in yes 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 okay so it's a crowd crowdfunding page so anybody okay. can go and you can donate even 5 ringgit 10 ringgit doesn't matter uh, one grocery pack is uh, 100 ringgit worth right so each family gets one pack Uh, so i encourage people if you can you know try to at least contribute one pack but so many of them so many of my friends have contributed smaller amounts i, I don't mind right i mean if you can only afford to give to it again it's fine anything helps i mean sure. everything matters because uh, we've actually partnered with our friends uh, mygrocer.com uh, okay. as a founder as a close friend of mine so they've been amazing because they are the the actual cost of the products in that pack is actually more than 100 ringgit Uh, so unlike some other delivery that takes you know 65% commission sure. and all that <laughs> so we actually yeah. give you know yeah. 100 ringgit pack the items are actually worth about for the retail price right it's about yeah. 110 and so our partners mygrocer.com actually absorb the difference and okay. they are doing free delivery on top of that okay they don't charge their usual delivery 
Wonderful. So we pay flat 100 ringgit per pack and they pack everything and they deliver it directly to the recipients. Yep. So we have people applying through a online form. Uh, actually, a lot of uh, people who've been working with some of these communities. Yep. So they usually collect all this info, they verify for us and then they send us the details. Yep. And then we will verify, our team verifies as well. And then once okay. they're selected, we deliver directly to them. So, so far that's been going good. Uh, a lot of people have food to eat now, so I'm very happy. And I'm so thankful for the people who contributed. Uh, us in our team, we have contributed our own money as well, but sure. most of the money have come from the public. Most of it, you know, our friends, families, people who follow us on social media. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really amazing. I mean, I, I didn't expect that we will raise this much. Our initial target was 10,000, and then we hit that within four days. And then now it's going to be almost a month, so we've almost doubled our collection. But we might extend, try to extend the campaign for another month, because since MCO is extended and the effects of this MCO is going to last for a while now, so we might extend the campaign and try to raise more money so that we can you know, help more families or help the same families who already received our earlier help. Maybe after you know, one month, we might send them another pack if they still need help. You still there, John? Oh, seems like a boss have disappeared. <laughs> So we have uh, lost our big boss. <laughs> uh, Jiggy is out of the building. Uh, so wait, let me just wait for him and see whether he comes back online again. So for those of you who are just joining us, like I was saying earlier, uh, we were talking about uh, online training. Uh, so yeah, there's nothing wrong with online uh, you know, training. It's, Hello? Yes, you're back. <laughs> So it's funny, but this is the second time this is happening. Um, uh, two two weeks ago, I, I I went off my own stream, and my yeah. guest hijacked my show. And looks like you did the same. <laughs> yeah, because I kept talking, and then I realized you were not moving. So <laughs> no, actually, so where I, I was was I, I think it's uh, it's very noble what you and a few others uh, who I personally know have actually taken upon themselves to lead these initiatives. And uh, so I think it's amazing, you know. And I'll be sure to go check out your crowdfunding page. And I think I I. I I ask everyone who's had a chance to watch us or, or who knows, I think, just do your part. You know, I mean, each and every one of us, I think we should always remember to count our blessings and, and, and just name them one by one. And in moments like this, when we can do a little bit like this, because the beauty of crowdfunding is, you know, you can give anything, right? And that's what you yeah. said. You know, there's no amount. I think, and, you know, for some of us, we might be you know, also in trouble, you know, business and blah, 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 income. We are, we are worrying about all this. But as much as we want to complain about what we are going through, Yep. There are people out there who are in a worse situation, right? Yep. Yeah, worse off than yep. us. So, so I think it's it's good to do as much as we can because, yep. I mean, this is something that nobody expected, right? I mean, usually you have the economic slowdown and blah blah blah. We somehow manage. I mean, I was just telling a friend a few days ago. Yeah, uh, you know, some years ago when we had all this slowdown and all that, fine. If Malaysian clients are not spending money, I can always get some project from UK, from US, from Australia. We can always survive somehow. Uh, you know, economy down or up, we are still making yep. money. But now the yep. entire world is in lockdown. No, so pretty much, yeah, everyone is out, right? So everyone's struggling. So I think when we look at, uh, you know, people who are in this situation, it, it's, it's because it's not only people who we don't know, right? Uh, yep. People who are connected directly to us. I mean, yep. Even uh, the, the lady who cleans my office. Yep. I mean, every month she cleans like, you know, 10, 20 offices. That's a uh, monthly income. Yep. So even the first month in April, I paid her. Right, uh, and then, but she said nobody else paid her because she still did you know half the month of job, but and then come uh, sorry March and then April, one whole month lockdown right. Yeah. So for someone like that, pretty much you know one month one week without pay and you have no food at home. Yeah. So so, so the, yeah. We've got a question here from uh, Chin Singh Choi. Are yeah. online training programs in Malaysia getting more traction now compared to pre MCO? What's your take on that? 
Yeah, definitely. Like you said earlier, right? People are taking this uh, opportunity to upskill themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. And I think a lot of uh, businesses also, they are probably sending their, uh, you know, taking this time to send their employees for further training. Yep. And all the trainings are going online. Uh, so that is definitely a trend. So, but I think what we were discussing earlier is just yep. that, that being, uh, having substance. So if whatever training or program, whether it's through your business, through your company or Personally, you want to upskill yourself. If you sign up for uh, training with a good trainer or a legitimate trainer with good substance, good module, good content, I think that's absolutely fine. Uh, and I think that's something that you should do if you have a time off. Might as well learn new skills or improve your existing skills. Yeah. Uh, but just don't fall for you know scammy programs that is just there out to take your money uh, with you know absolutely no uh, content or content that you can easily just Google up. Because a lot of these uh, very scammy programs, sometimes they just easily just Google up, you know, copy and paste content from other trainers, and they just resell it as their own program. So they actually don't develop their own content. Yeah. So in a way, uh, and you know, it's very hard to even track. It's very hard to f you know find out that people just copy pasted this content unless you've seen it somewhere else. Uh, so those kind of trainers, I don't think they deserve that attention and and also deserve our money. That's what I yeah. think. Just to add on to that, I think uh, mentioning, uh, just adding on to what you said. So if you are part of an organization, uh, especially a bigger a bigger company or MNCs, if they ever send you for training, I stand corrected here, but at least when I've had the chance to field trainers for my clients during our event, I can assure you they have curated the trainers that are coming or you know that you're going to be tied up with. But I think the, the, the scenario that we've been discussing today has been a case of those who have been signing up on their own, yeah. uh, sitting at home and being lured in. They've been catfished by advertisements that they have just seen on their timeline, on their social media feeds. And, and this is where we've been uh, kind of uh, just asking people to just focus on, on, on using a bit more, uh, you know, be, be a bit more careful and, and do your research and things like that you know i think so, i think some of the, the the signs are very obvious right the moment yeah. people the moment people put a guru next to their name i mean that's for me is the first first red flag right hey dude so my title is <laughs> eventainment guru huh? so be careful where you go there but you know but we've seen you in action you are always on the ground man doing work so see you you have earned that title i think <laughs> I, i'm sure you didn't put that title you know 10 years ago uh, I, well, uh, well, well, you? Because well, I knew you as Jiggy John when I first saw your name card. I think probably a decade ago. No, my name card. My name is Jiggy John, but my title has been yeah. Entertainment Guru. I actually since yeah. two thousand and eight, so that's twelve years. Uh, so, nice. But the company is now turning twenty, so okay lah, got a bit of substance <laughs> lah. <laughs> so I mean, for me, yeah. when I see an on online training program, yeah, and if it's yeah. an unknown trainer, and uh, I see a guru next to that name, that yeah. you know, I'm I'm usually very suspicious. Yeah. Uh, the next one is when they throw big numbers out there, right? right. When they say, "Oh, make hundred thousand ringgit in ten days, make a million in ten days," uh, those kind of promises, you know, yeah. straight away is like mm, that's that's a bit shady. Yeah. Or they they can say, "Oh, we you know we generated hundred thousand in sales for a client, or one million in sales for a client." The thing is, when people genuinely do it you notice they don't usually shout out those numbers. Mm. I mean, I'm sure you don't go out and shout out how much your client paid you to do an event. You might shout out about the event and how awesome it is and who your clients are, but very rarely you'll shout out numbers, how much they paid you, right? That's Unless how it works, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one one is you want to protect the you know your client's privacy and blah, blah, blah. There are a lot of things to it. You won't even simply... So most of the time when people throw numbers like that, it's because it's fake. They know nobody gives a shit, so they can just throw whatever number and it's you know mm -hmm. very easily to make a screenshot nowadays to make a screenshot of your bank account with 10 million ringgit you don't even need photoshop i can do that in like on the browser itself for two minutes right i can put like one one billion into my maybank to your account in two minutes do a screenshot it, it's so easy through i don't even have to open my my photoshop so oh my lord yeah so yeah. and you and you see that right you see yeah. people uh, giving you screenshots of how much they make in a month and most of the time it's fake yeah. so those kind of things the more because uh, these are techniques that are taught to them right yeah there are a lot of trainers who train them train you know, the training for the trainers so yeah. they train people how to become trainers like this uh, how to you know fish your clients how to so these are all the things you do so it's, it's a very uh, very template kind of thing so yeah. once you see the template you see that same pattern the same template so you kind of know okay this is just another trainer who just went for a training and then now he thinks he's a trainer yeah so 
So that's uh, some of the ways that you can easily know whether somebody has substance or not. But the other way is to actually go through a program. Yeah. So, so I mean, I don't have much time, so I'm a bit more picky about the trainings or programs I would attend. Of course, um, of course. Yeah. And and this is where Arvind's point is also is, uh, is important. You know, to what he says, it's important to know the difference between training for regular SME type entrepreneurships and training yeah. for tech startups because the former yeah. they often think it's the same, but it's not because it is honestly two separate train of thought. Yeah, yeah definitely. You know, because even so, when I do my, because I mean, when I was running my co-working space, I used to do a lot of training as well, mm. uh, and the co-working space, right? So uh, there's a clear difference between uh, creating a tech startup. Uh, you know, with a scalable business model than to start a regular business like a restaurant, which yeah. is also a business. I mean, I'm yeah. I, I'm not a I'm in the middle. I'm okay with both, right? right. If you want to start a regular business, brick and mortar business, yeah. go ahead. If that's your passion, it's going to make you money. Go ahead. I mean, not everybody has to launch a Facebook, uh, yeah. but if you want to, uh, you know, launch a tech startup, a scalable business, purely digital, go ahead. If that's your passion and that's your skill and that's where you think you can make money. So I, as a as an entrepreneur, I'm I'm very happy when people become entrepreneurs, right? I'm a big, mm. uh, I'm a, I'm what do you call it? I'm the biggest cheerleader. Anybody wants to learn entrepreneurship or try or just jump in and and experience it, I'm like, let's go. Right, uh, so right. I'm very happy to help anybody. Yeah. Uh, but anything a bit, uh, the moment I feel anything scammy or shady, I'm like, mm. oh, no, <laughs> no, I'm not going to support that. So yeah, so I'm, I'm and- very picky about that. And I think you've started doing some videos, if I'm not wrong, uh, on your on your channel as well. I've seen you do a couple of plugs here and there, at least in mm. the last couple of months, and or at least the last month. Uh, and what are the topics that you've covered? Huh? Okay, so mine have been uh, more towards uh, community building, right? Because okay. I've been a community builder for more than a decade now. Okay. Uh, so to me, uh, there was not really to plug anything to business or anything. I don't think in any of the videos I've mentioned much anything about my business. Uh, it was more about uh, my community because I, I manage a group, uh, a Facebook group called Open Coffee Club KL, which is a business networking event, uh, which is kind of open. It's for tech startups and also regular SME entrepreneurs. Anybody can come and join. Uh, we used to regularly meet, monthly meet up, physical meet up, uh, and then we had a break. And then we actually restarted just end of last year before the MCO started. We had about five five meetups. So once a month we meet up. So there's a very active online community and also a, a physical meetup once a month. So I wanted to keep that going uh, during the lockdown. Uh, okay. Which is why I started that uh, that a talk show type of thing, right? Uh, okay. The late, late show with Inbraj. It was actually a, like a it was a spontaneous thing. It was just me and a, another two friends. We did a live stream. and we was just talking cock for a while, and I'm like, okay, you know what? I can just do this. Call it right. a late show. And just invite some. So the first topic I think we did one on business, very general, with yeah. our friend Dash, who who started a startup Malaysia, and also Arvind here, who mm-hmm. runs Start Fund now. Yeah. Uh, so it was more geared towards the tech community and the startup community. And then I did another session on 3D printing for to fight COVID-19. Because now we yeah. have our, our whole 3D printing community is all out printing all these face shields and, and other equipments for our doctors, uh, the frontliners to work because there's a shortage of PPE. Yeah. So I think that was a very interesting topic. So I wanted to kind of showcase their work as well. And then the third one I did was on social entrepreneurship because mm-hmm. actually many of our, our social enterprises are doing a great job now because one thing is their business is doing very well because most of them are are working on, on this kind of very related uh, fields yep. and many of them also pivoted uh, into you know many of them are now really working with the underprivileged communities and some of them are working with refugees uh, and uh, so i wanted to showcase them as well uh, so that was the three i think proper streams that we did okay uh, so the next topic is supposed to be on site hustle so, okay uh, so i did a poll and most of them selected site hustle as the most popular topic so everybody wants to know how you can start a side hustle and especially during the lockdown or even post lockdown, right? Because right. the post post uh, MCO world is going to be very different. It's not just right. about the lockdown. So which is one of the things that I mentioned in one of my other live shows as well. Uh, you know, if you plan something now, if you want to launch a business or whatever initiative, anything, yeah. don't plan something that works only for the MCO. Mm. Because once the MCO ends, uh, you know, the life will not go back to normal, right? So there's a, everything will be different. So plan something that can go beyond the mco so right. plan, it works during the mco and will also be relevant once the mco is lifted uh, but still you know because there'll be a lot of new changes in the way we live the way we do business for sure so i think that's very important so like somebody i think asked earlier will the trend continue of the mco this e-learning right. trend? definitely because i think even if once the mco is lifted it's going to take a while before people start gathering in for between. sure, for sure. Uh, yeah, a lot of trainings will still be online uh, many meetings will be still online uh, so that is the trend. 
uh, and you know we kind of have to adapt to that uh, yeah. but hopefully businesses will resume and you know clients will start spending money and we'll still uh, do more things uh, activities will resume yeah but the way we do things right even events i'm sure a lot of events now if, even if you are allowed to do a physical event you probably have to have a booth where you have to still put a thermometer you know and on everybody's forehead yeah. put a put a hand sanitizer at the entrance and every exit so there are new things you need to implement cost will change correct we we have to be prepared for that that world uh, i mean so, i'm already pivoting to virtual events you know who that i never yeah. thought i would already be you know i mean you've always had the option to do live streaming and or you know live events yeah. but now it is uh, the catchphrase you know it's yeah. it's it's the go to i mean we've got clients banging on our doors uh, for what are the options for taking the same event that we were planning in the classic format to uh, we're going from uh, industrial 1.0 to 5.0 just like that like you know <laughs> no, but i think what's interesting is now everyone is ready for it you see yeah 6 months ago we can easily do a online event but half of the crowd will say they don't have a webcam you know or they don't have this they don't have that they don't have a mic uh, and you know people might not have good broadband but now everybody is kind of forced to put everything in place because now they need that to basically you know try to live their lives so to talk so, about uh, that to talk about that i decided to bring a guest on the show a surprise oh. for you in baraj <laughs> uh, let's see uh, who's that it is our third man mr aaron sarma hello hello what's up bro how are you how's it going <laughs> how was your live how was your live show on tv that not bad not bad that's okay you <laughs> obviously a very interesting format on on tv actually because they do like this interesting thing where they call you on your mobile phone Mm. and then this this Skype you in for video so the whole time you can't see anybody you can't hear anything except you know what's on the, on your where we're talking to you at the time so, so it's a like one way thing yeah pretty much one way yeah okay. i didn't even know what dot was wearing until after the show <laughs> <laughs> no it's funny that you've joined us just as the conversation has steered because uh we've even got arvin i think who's still watching uh and and we 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 were talking about uh internet gurus but uh, the conversation steered towards a bit of uh, tech and startup and then boom you suddenly jump in so i think uh, well scale up has been going great guns in the last one month or, or six weeks or two months and uh, it's, it's, yeah it's, for the last couple of weeks has been good for us a lot of good news yeah yeah so i mean with all that's been happening uh, some mama session uh, you want to come in arvin i asked you earlier now only you're asking the monkey <laughs> I invited him an hour ago. No. When he, when did we say this is a formal show? We are not on TV. Yeah, we are not on TV. This when you are on the internet, you can do whatever you want. That's why mo- most of the even the TV talk shows, you know, they go online after that, right? The, yeah, the yeah. posts. Yeah. Uh, and that's post. where and on that session they can swear and they say what they want. The the well, post show recap. Well, Ar- Arvin, <laughs> Arvin, since you're itching to join the party, I'm going to send you the link check your WhatsApp. <laughs> No, but uh, Aaron, what we were saying was, um, I think, how about just give us a what are you allowed to give us an up to date up on on scale up and and just you know where we're going because it's ironic that everyone else has been really quiet during MCO, but you and the team have just been just just busting your 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 gut lah, you know, and and then now we're reading about it, so it's I think that will actually spur. at least the online community that's here with us today and, and us as well so just share with us what you can i mean the good thing with the way we structured scale up is we had a program that was going to last 6 months uh with each of these companies and in month 4 we were going to announce the 10 companies we're going to invest in anyway right right uh, um and and how that happens is we bring in 20 companies we work with them for 2 3 4 months um and this gives us a lot of exposure to the companies we understand how it works we understand their team a little bit better uh during this time we bring in people like specialists to come and give them specialized training uh, be yep. hr finance product tech that kind of thing uh and we use this this time to set the side sessions with each of the companies so like after like a classroom session we do like a like a one on one coaching session with, with the company to kind of do like a deep dive and understand where the issues are and these are the kinds of things we can do at scale up because we don't focus on early stage companies for acceleration we're focusing on companies with revenue and with product and market so it's the kind of topics we talk about can be a little bit more serious and we can actually there's actually stuff to deep dive into because we have data we've got track record we've got history and stuff to look at um and then we were going to do like a investment committee panel session uh, in april 
But guess what happened in the end of March? Uh, MCO started. And so mm. we were then faced with the dilemma, like, you know, what do we do? And so at first, some th- we were talking, maybe we should just, like, not do it. Like, maybe we just wait until MCO ends. And this was in the era, remember? Like, some time ago, we thought it would be two weeks. Uh, not, like, two months. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, back then, so we thought, okay, we can wait this out. But then as it looked like it was going to be longer, we had to, like, grapple with the idea of, okay, maybe we have to do the IC. And, mm. and this was actually a moment. And I think one thing people don't think about is that uh, crisis can be opportunities as well. Yeah. And, right? And, and obviously, there are challenges, and obviously, it's not always easy. But we made the decision that this is going to be an opportunity for us to kind of Oh, Arvin, your hair, dude. It's like, <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> Jackson 5 is in the house. <laughs> yeah. Jackson 5. Yeah. It's definitely longer since the last time I saw you online. <laughs> sorry, just finish up, Aaron. Didn't okay, yeah. Up. Yeah. No worries, no worries. Yeah, sorry. The, the flow was kind of something. Um, no, so we did the in- investment community panel. And actually, we had to do a special session before the IC. Uh, are, you, are you feeling peer pressure now? Like, this is going on. <laughs> throw, like, bring the throw <laughs> <out>. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so we felt like, okay, uh, we had to train our guys. We did like a special session with our companies, uh, like a bit of a training, how to do an online pitch, because it's very different. And I don't know, like, I mean, you, uh, John, you're very much an outgoing guy and an extrovert kind of guy, right? So I don't know about you, but this medium of doing a presentation where I cannot really see and touch and feel the audience, yep. it's kind of weird for me. And I can imagine it's weird for a lot of the companies, right? Like even for me, right? I'm not an extrovert. I'm pretty much an introvert. Um, and even for me, it's weird because I kind of feed off the reaction I get from the crowd and I know if I'm going the right direction or not, right? And, and so for a lot of the companies, when you're doing a pitch, and if you've ever done a Google Meet pitch or Google Hangouts pitch, you'll know that it has a very interesting feature where when you're presenting and you're in presenter mode, you can't see anyone. Mm. And so it's very difficult. And so we had yeah. to kind of help the companies go through this. We did a lot of like practice sessions with them before we went to IC. And then eventually we did the IC and we selected our 10 companies. And that was a really difficult decision to do. Sure. Eventually uh, those companies, it was really competitive at the end, which we were very pleasantly surprised, but also very stressed about because in the end we could only choose 10. And right. so we chose, um, and the other thing about IC is that our IC was not just us, it was including our investors. So we yeah. have two panelists on the, on the IC who are investors who help us make the decision and um, eventually we chose our 10. Um, and, and we've been, I guess because we came in this moment, like you mentioned, right, where a lot of investors are kind of holding on to their wallets. And um, even before we did the announcement that we were investing in 10, I was involved in like a webinar that I organized. and. On the webinar, there was an investor who, was, who made a comment like, a lot of VCs have cash right now, mm. but they're holding on to it. Mm. And the reason they're holding on to it is because they're worried that, uh, firstly, they're Kiasu, I guess. Uh, secondly, uh, I think they're, 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 they're worried that one of their companies is going to call them up for a capital call and say, you know, hey, bro, I'm running out of cash. What do I do now? As a, as a VC, you've already dumped a couple of million in the company. What are you going to do? You, you, you kind of have to keep them alive or yeah. you're going to sink all your money, right? So a lot of, VCs were kind of um, are kind of holding on to cash for these sorts of reasons, and so they're not really investing. Or if even if they are investing, they're investing slower. Yeah. So they're taking longer to make decisions. I think there is an element of wait and see going on where people are just kind of seeing what the opportunities are before making a serious decision. Yeah. So uh, we felt that. But by coming out with this news, it will, it will send like a good signal to the market, and at least people can know that there are parties out there who are looking. And hopefully, other bodies, other investment firms will take the lead and start investing more aggressively, right? Um, yeah. And so, and, and good thing is because we came out when we did, we got a lot of traction with the company. So uh, some of the publications were publishing stories about them. Uh, how uh, Batik Boutique has repurposed her entire factory from producing Batik to doing PPE for the for the hospital. Damn! So that's like, yeah, it's like really, really. Yeah, no, that's quite amazing. Yeah, so I think like that's a really great like repurposing of the same factory, and you hear I don't know when you hear read about like war stories from World War Two where they repurpose like you know the GM factory to make planes and stuff. Like that. It's kind of like yeah. this, right? Um, 
we we see guys like uh, A1, who's like a tuition center, and they start doing like e-learning because yeah. they were just helping tuition centers have like a back office kind of system. Yeah. And then they figured, okay, now there is no tuition. What yeah. do we do now? And we have to facilitate through e-learning and you figure out a way to do that. Um, a few weeks ago, there was a, uh, an article that came out in the papers about how the Cameron uh, Highlands farmers weren't able to get their produce out to market. Uh, and one of our companies, Golok, kind of stepped in and now they do all the deliveries for the Cameron Highlands. Oh, um, so, yeah. so, so like these are really nice stories of good companies and we felt like, look, these guys are doing a good, good job. They're doing really good work. Um, instead of being sedate and holding back, and I see a comment there, some are waiting for a bigger dip and better valuation. It's not the time to hold back. I think it's the time to kind of push forward because I think when you help the companies at this stage, you're actually able to take them to the next stage. And uh, one thing that I did not say in the interview just now was we forget, right? The last big recession was in 2008. And in 2008, a lot of companies had a tough time as well. But out of 2008, we got Uber, we got Slack, we got Spotify. These are all unicorns today, and they came out of the 2008 Great Recession. Hmm. So it kind of makes you wonder, like, if you actually back companies at this stage, um, actually, there's a huge opportunity here. And and I mean, I, I I've seen like some people make comments like, oh, you know, maybe government shouldn't be the solution, and no other country does this. And that's not really true, you know. Do you know? Uh, and this is a book, uh, the author, her last name is Mazagato, and the book is called The Entrepreneurial State. And in this book, uh, they, she goes through how the government can actually be a stimulus for growth in the tech ecosystem. And a story she gives is that we all know, or rather it's more publicized, the story about how the US government uh, in the Obama administration gave something like half a billion dollars to a company called Solyndra. And if you you know this news, uh, Solyndra didn't do well, there's a big hue and cry about how the money was wasted, blah, 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 right? Around about the same time they gave the money to Solyndra, they gave about $480 million to another company. Guess another company? Tesla. So it can't, I mean, we don't hear about this because obviously nobody makes noise about it this way, mm. but you realize that, look, the government has a role to play in certain some of these tech innovations, and the government can play an effective role in this case. Mm. And so I think it's one of those things where there are opportunities here. And if we back our companies at this stage, there's a huge opportunity to build great businesses moving forward. This is not the time to hold back. It's time to push forward. I think. I'm actually very happy about how li loud you guys are about the investment. Not mm -hmm. only you invested in the startups, I think the, the press release and all that, I think really good. Yeah. That's going to, like you said, right? It's going to inspire other people as well to say mm -hmm. that, hey, maybe we should also follow suit. And it's also going to inspire other startups. Startups are going to think, yes. hey, maybe if we pivot now, if we come up with something cool, we can get funded as well. The oh. Instead of just giving up and say, hey, nobody's investing, everybody's going to hold on to their money, let's all just close shop. Now, yeah. a lot of startups are going to go out there and say, hey, let's do something really cool. Let's pivot. Let's come up with something yeah. smart so that investors will take notice because these guys are investing and other people might be investing as well. So I think that's really good for the ecosystem. So yeah. I have to say thank you for, to you guys for, for doing that. I think that's no really worries, amazing. Man. Yeah. Arvin. Arvin Jackson. Hey, no, cannot hear you. We can't hear you, man. Oh man. No. All right. <laughs> well no, no. And, 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 see. and it would be good if you weighed in on the actual topic that we started off, uh Aaron. Um sure. I, I don't know if we should put you in the hot seat just like that because uh in Inviraj and me were quite vocal about it, but uh it's just that the the recent uh, scenario of everyone being seated at home has given rise to an influx of uh, internet gurus selling their wares like car salesmen. Yes, I, I see this every, all the time, everywhere, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we, we were just trying to play the devil's advocate here because uh, there are some people that we know that was waiting and, and, and 15 minutes later, Superstar had yet to make an appearance after the original. I mean, so that's just one, you know, scenario. So, I mean, I mean, I do this for a living. I speak. I'm up there, and I and I, and I put people on stage. So you know, just down to that, and then credibility of speakers and all. But anyways, in a nutshell, what's your take? Already, oh, he he disappeared. So what's your take uh, on uh, uh, you know internet gurus, or at least how can people, as as we clearly said, we're not against it. Uh, you know, upskilling, educating yourself by all means. But how can people just safeguard themselves from falling prey to 
just damn good salesmen. Yeah, I think this is a really tough thing for the average person to kind of suss out, especially since there's so many of these guys. And admittedly, they're all very good. Uh, and sometimes I like to watch them uh, because I like to see the sales technique and see how they do it. And like, you, you know, um, like way back in a different life, I was doing a lot of these kind of sales kind of stuff, right? And 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 back in those days, you were trained to notice certain tricks, right? That people use yeah. and things they were using. And so I, I like to to do that. And, and people come and approach me and they tell me they got I me. Mean, and immediately my my MLM or network marketing or uh, <laughs> or salesman uh, spidey sense are tingling and like I know what's coming next. And wait, then, wait, wait, hold that uh, thought. Hold that thought. Yeah. In Baraj, do you know that this told me? <laughs> Uh, was an MLM god? Really? Do you know Imbaraj is completely anti MLM, and we had a conversation <laughs> about that. And you're looking at a homeboy who went to president or whatever level in less than two years. Yeah, that's bad. And I, but this I, is I, a I MLM, life, uh, previews just to, like you yeah. said, right? I just go there to observe how they do the the brainwashing yeah. techniques. That's right. And then I, I I notice all the patterns of how they do it. Some of that. I mean, some of these these programs, right? They're so brilliantly designed to brainwash people. Uh, it's very easy for people to just buy into it, right? But like I was, we, were, we were talking earlier, we were talking about substance. I mean, e-learning is great, uh, and taking this time off to you know upskill yourself is amazing. But it's just about trying to find the right program, the right trainers, people with substance. So even if you're paying for it, uh, you know you must make sure that you get good uh, you know content out of it, uh, not just fall for great marketing and then end up with basically yeah. getting scammed, you know. Yeah, I think that's where we should encourage people to kind of be more careful. I mean, we can't stop people from marketing. People can always come up with all kinds of creative ways of marketing, uh, but it's I think it's just our responsibility to make sure we don't do, we don't fall for it, right? Yeah. Mm. I'm gonna try one more thing. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Now, now yes. we can hear you. So Good. hold your horses. Aaron, finish what you were saying. Then we'll come on to this superstar. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I echo what Imba is saying as well, right? I think ultimately you got to make sure that the uh, obviously everybody's going to have a good sales pitch. Yep. So you have to peel below the sales pitch to see what the content really is. Mm. Uh, a, a huge flag is if you have to pay for stuff beforehand. Like if people are going to ask you to pay like five figures or high four figures to just join a course, you should ask yourself why, you know, and, and you should figure uh -huh. out whether or not it's worth it, right? Or, and and you, like, you got to figure out whether or not the cost material is really worth what they say it is, right? Like, You'll find out like a lot of them, oh, I'm gonna teach you how to do social media marketing, pay me four thousand ringgit and I'll teach you the tricks and tips, right? Mm. And you can easily go to Coursera or to Udemy or something or you know, and, and learn the exact same thing for fifty ringgit. Like it's it's there, you know, it doesn't it, it's not something that is unlockable, but yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that everybody needs to be more responsible, needs to kind of take the decisions you make into your if Jiggy yeah. wants to teach how to do events and he charges a you know five figure number, I think people should pay for it. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I mean, Jiggy is credibility. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I think that's I think the thing. It boils down. To, it comes to that. Look, I mean, if I'm going to teach, okay, events, or I'd rather teach emceeing or public speaking more than events. But FYI, yeah. So I mean, it makes sense. So if Aaron's going to talk about how to uh, build a startup and take it to whatever, whatever, it makes sense, you know. And and Aaron, uh, Arvin. Now that we can hear you. Yeah, I, I mean. The, the first know, verse of ABC, come on, go, go, go. <laughs> Inba and I have been wanting to, we've been talking about, um, you know, late last year we thought, you know, because I think looking at where scale up is, and, you know, a bit further along in the, you know, the startup evolution, um, I think as community builders, Inba and I operate very early on, right, in the startup mm. creation side of things. So we, we realized that, Earlier, I mentioned that there's a lot of training for regular SME type business. You know, like uh, how do you how do you do a business plan? How do you do digital marketing? I mean, these are great for you know the engine of the economy, which is SMEs. But when you come to tech startups, right? Other than incubator incubator type uh, structures, there aren't meant, there, there isn't much in by way of training. Now we want to do a training program, and we are you know we are struggling whether we can charge a thousand ringgit for a three day course, or thousand five, and we're feeling guilty. Will people pay? People not pay? And then I see, I see Yahoo's on in, on the internet charging eight thousand for a three day course, and six thousand, and and I, and you know I'm 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 bewildered. I have people telling me, hey, you know, you know, and and none of these guys have raised money from a VC. None of these guys have done, and they're specifically in tech startups, you know, right? So to me, you know, the the words innovation, digital, all just thrown in. It's just 
it's so much fluff and I mean, look, I'm, I believe in a free market, right? I think people should, it's caveat emptor, right? If somebody wants to sell it, somebody wants to buy it, there's a sucker born every day. But unfortunately, it's not a zero-sum game, you know? When somebody takes out 8,000 from the economy like that, that money is lost. You know, it, it, it sends a very bad message out there. It creates a lot of bad experiences. And it really, as Inva mentioned earlier, it really does create a lot of skepticism for people who just, you know, not only have the right experience, but another big element, is people who have the right intent. Like, you know, some of us really are quite um, passionate about not doing good, but just getting our views out there, right? So for example, I'm really passionate about creating new startups. Why? Because I I believe that's that's the way to grow the ecosystem. You need more startups. And one of the ways to do that is to do more training, right, in the early stage. And But then that creates a skepticism, you know, do I, you know, do you really need, the, the, you know, these courses? And it makes it that much harder. So. I I would, and I think there is a sucker born every day. You say peel back the layers, right, Aaron? But most people won't, you know. They fall for the, you know, they fall for the for the for the jargon. They fall for the marketing, and and and, and people like me who have a lot of self doubt about whether and what I'm doing is, you know, is it good? You know, should we? You know, is it ready? You know, and and, and stuff like that. That doesn't it doesn't cut through the market. Donald Trump cuts through the market. Right, mm -hmm. this program it's the best. It's gonna be the best. It's amazing. Yeah, drink Lysol, whatever. No big issue. You know, shit. I've got all these people who think it's great. Make America great again. Yeah, you know, it's uh, <laughs> you know. So that is um, that is a challenge, you know, and yeah. and to identify some measure of substance. I mean, it's all subjective, but some measure of substance. I think, I think um, a stamp of approval by you know uh, a board. Would be would be would be would be pretty good like some kind of you know rep, like a regulator or a or an agency or even like a HRDF kind of thing right to make it easier for this type of training to come in, I think it's, I think you know because sometimes even the regulators don't understand right? they're like what you want to do lean startup, oh digital marketing we know but lean startup you know I'm not sure whether you know I mean. I've even come across uh, some locals running their little private academies and they're certifying people and I'm like. How? How? Yeah. On, on what grounds? Yeah. <laughs> Who certified you? Yeah. And which which employers look at this and go, hmm, yeah. yes, I'll hire this person now. <laughs> uh, but but for what it's worth, it's more for the gig economy workers. So it's more of these independent, uh, they themselves are out there on their own, you know, because they, they, they work gig to gig. Uh, it's it's definitely not for the everyday guys. I mean, I mean, I'm not to use the word fly by night per se, but I mean, I, I just often I get very concerned that, as you say, you know, I mean, there's a sucker born every day, but it's almost too easy to hoodwink people. And, and why? I mean, can't you guys just use some some element of common sense, uh, you know? Um, and, and I think when you look at how they market themselves, it's like the next question that we have here: What is your take on online <laughs> motivational gurus, the coaches, the life coaches? Most of them very young, probably just left university and giving vague ideas on how to lead a happy life. How credible are they? I think you answered your own question there, Lars so fun. I mean, I mean, if they just came out of college, I mean, I think these are mostly the influencers and they gauge it based on their follower base and how successful they are on a social media uh, standing uh, because a lot of them actually earn a side hustle being influencers and key opinionated leaders. And because they actually contribute to their personal economy by giving opinions, they automatically group themselves as being uh, someone of influence who can, for instance, coach somebody or motivate somebody. And the funny thing is, for those who are within the context of their circles, actually say, yeah, that, that person is my motivator or that person is my coach because it's very attainable within their circle. They look at their fellow, hey, that guy is my age and he's living that life. That means he's doing something right and I'm not. If you think about it, I mean, Maybe our circles would look at what, I don't know, the Tony Robbins of the world and, and whatever else, and, and we use that as a yardstick, right? Uh, but I think, how credible are they? I don't know. Has anybody else got a point of view here? I mean, I think like earlier I was talking about this as well, right? I think some of them actually go through these trainings that teaches them how to do this. So they go to this pro program that teaches them how to become an online trainer, which is why they do all this life coach thing and all that, which is they just follow the template. So it's not even something that they come up with their own, right? Mm. They don't come up with their own philosophies or ideas. They just have this template from their trainers, which they just parrot. 
and they know it makes money because it's a proven template. Mm. So I think that's how that's why some of them are very young. They're really yeah. young. They just so you know, yeah, I think probably you don't even have to go to college I mean, to do that. I think it depends on what you're ultimately what you're charging, right? I mean, if 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 let's say you never made nasulama before in your life, and you want to make nasulama and sell it at the same price as everybody else is selling it, like Village Park, by all means, you know, we need you know that that's the economy, right? But if you are telling people your nasulama is the best nasulama because you found some way to hoodwink people and you're charging four times as much. You know, I mean, yes, it's a market, but there is some, you know, anything that is mis some kind of misrepresentation. Like you know the the whole property millionaire thing, right? I have nothing against him. I think he's a. I think he's. A, I think he's made good money. But I mentioned in one of my comments earlier, right? Just because you did it, it makes it very hard for you to articulate. Um, you you're, you're basically selling the dream right you're telling people mm. that just oh, i made it mm. i can you know other people can be me but mm. let's like let's take tony for tony fernandez not everybody can be tony fernandez you know you, you can't i can't he can't train people to be like him mm. right i mean it took me 10 years of my life to realize i'm not going to be ananda krishnan because he lived in a very different time you know there were different opportunities he had different a different path you can at best learn the attributes and the philosophy of thought maybe to some extent but that requires a special skill. That's why masterclass is such a great uh, program because it's not about teaching someone to be Gordon Ramsay. He, he, Gordon Ramsay is not saying you can be Gordon Ramsay. He's saying, look, let me teach you how to cook well in your house. Yeah. And if you want to open a small restaurant, I, I'm enabling you to that baseline. The, yeah. the, I think it's also about the in, inspiration, right? Like right. you watch those you know? videos, you're not going to follow the recipe, but you're going to be inspired yeah. to cook. I'm telling I someone, mean, hey, look, I made 10 yeah. million bucks. You can make 10 million bucks if you pay me $8,000 today. That's, I think, misrepresentation, you know, like that's where it starts getting a bit, you know, a bit dodgy. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, Jamie Oliver can still inspire people to cook, but, yeah. you know, he can't inspire people to do business. He's shutting down all his restaurants, right? Yeah. So, you know, so it's yeah. It's a very right. different thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I would still watch him cook and immediately feel like cooking after that. I mean, I, I actually started cooking because of Jamie Oliver, right? I used to watch him on Singapore TV when I was studying in uh, UTM. Yeah, we so, see your hashtag, uh, naked hashtag. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that's where I came from, right? So, when I was like 19, uh, probably 20, uh, and Malaysian TV didn't have Jamie Oliver yet. So he was on Singapore Singapore Channel. So we used to get Singapore Channel in JB. So then I discovered Jamie Oliver. I'm like, wow, amazing, mind blowing, the naked chef. <laughs> so he you know, inspired me to cook. But right. until now, I don't think I've even followed a single one of his recipe, you know, 20 mm. years forward in life. Yeah. But he inspired me to cook. That's, that's the most important thing. And I think a lot of trainers, uh, coaches, gurus can do that uh, to a certain extent they, if they have the substance right if they've gone through it they have the substance they can inspire other people yeah but if it's purely based on a template and they've never done it before then it's you know a bit uh, yeah i think when it comes down to these influencers right you look at um, you know the ones you see on youtube instagram stuff like that i think it's a it's it's a different category of um, you know, online sort of personalities than let's say people who are providing training and, you know, like something more technical, right? Mm. If you're a 25 year old influencer and you have a following of 30,000 people, and let's say you're, 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 you're teaching them on how to, to answer the question, right? Uh, on how to lead a happy life. If you influence even 30 people among or 50 people or hundred people that, you know, like I follow, I follow some influencers and honestly, every now and then there's a, there's a little bit of a nugget there, right? Uh, think of a scaled down version of the rock. Right. I mean, The Rock is 150 million followers, but think of a scaled down version. Everybody's got something to add. So I think it's a very different thing. I think influencers are OK because I'm not paying any money to these influencers. Mm. Right. At the end of the day, all they're getting is my mind share. Right. Yeah. I watch them. I, I want to listen. I don't listen. It's, you know, and every now and then if they say this saucepan is good, I buy this saucepan also. You know, I mean, it's yeah. like it, it's not costing me anything, but. Uh, I think that the issue is when you start charging in the in the marketplace. Yeah, but just some extra info, uh, some of these influencers, especially on Twitter, have uh, kind of gone to this Forex scam now. So there's a group of influencers who have uh, started selling those Forex signals and all that. Uh, so they show you all this, you know, like earlier we discussed those uh, Photoshopped uh, uh, bank balance and all that, right? So they'll show you all these screenshots about how much money they're making in US dollars from all these Forex uh, trading websites. And then they'll you subscribe to their signals. So they're making a lot of money. So it's, it's very scammy. Uh, probably they've realized they can't really make that much of money from their social media influencing work. So some of them have gone to this and a lot of young people are joining and you know losing their money to this because they're never gonna trade and make any money because it's all fake. Mm. Uh, but so these guys are very smart, right? 
they don't teach you the trade. It's more like, okay, this is what we've done, but now you just buy the signal. So it's very legal, right? I sell you signal, you give me money, I give you signal. But whether the signals work or not, doesn't matter to them. Arvind, I think we should do a startup on scams. La. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that, um, if I, you remember once we, we had a quick chat over over uh, dinner, Jiggy, was, um, you know, like, uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I mentioned this idea to you, and I still think it's a great idea, right? It may not be, I don't know how much, I don't know how to monetize it, but there should be a website where, you know, um, uh, people who provide a service like yourself, like, uh, you know, Inba yourself and all that, um, you know, to clients who don't pay. I think, you know, I think there should be a, just like how you have a rating for employers, <laughs> a rating, you know, like Glassdoor is a rating for employers. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thing out there, yeah. You, there should be a crowdsourced uh, rating system for the entire procurement industry. I think it's huge money, right? You know, because I think that's uh, collect. I, every time I talk to businessmen, I hear that collections is always a problem. Right. I'm like, why are these companies being named and shamed? <laughs> you know. Oh, well. that, that they're very nice people, are uh, exactly. Asian values. They're very nice. I was gonna say that's the Asian thing, lah. Like, you know, you're not gonna just outrightly burn someone. Uh, you know, it can public. be done. Um, uh, the way Glassdoor makes it work is actually brilliant, right? They don't mention any names. You know, it's yeah. you can opt to not mention any name, but yeah. it's you know, it's it's an anecdote, and then you need five complaints before it becomes uh, public. You know, there there are ways and means to sort of create this. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's um. I think it's so have I have I told you guys about scam book? No, no. What is that? No. So when I was running, so Jiggy, you know, I was running Street Deal for a while. Yeah. And so uh, we discovered this platform the hard way. Um, so there's a platform called Scam Book, right? And what it does is whenever there's an issue with any like consumer-based platform, you can go there and complain. Huh. Now what Scam Book does is it, it posts the complaints live on their own website on forums and whatnot, and then obviously the brands will freak out because they won't want it to be taken down, right? And and the only way you as a brand can take it, take it down is you have to pay Scambo. <laughs> and also, so that's a scam. Exactly. <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> it's just simply brilliant. So, this, yeah. one. this one right yeah, here. That's the one. <laughs> but, if you, but, if you, but if you take it one step further, and you, like, the only way to get taken down is by providing a resolution mechanism, right? That means yeah, you, you resolve yeah. it. And then people withdraw, and there's a there's an arbitration process. You know, I don't think, I think I think Malaysian entrepreneurs, if, if, if you know, eventually people watch the recording, and you know, if I my biggest uh, viewpoint is if you look at a lot of our, our most successful startups, right? Yeah. They have not been ideas that were I dare to say original. They have been Southeast Asian clones of very very successful. Uh, U.S. and you know Western Europe ideas, right? And maybe even China ideas. I think this is the way for you know, like from a simplistic perspective. I see something like Scambook. I think some entrepreneur there should do it because you know it is a way to. It is a huge market. It has a real need. It solves a pain point. Sometimes the best ideas are out there. You know, so like, I'll, I'll, call it, I'll call it Pokai. Pokai dot yeah. <laughs> so I think there is a there is like a regional or local. I'm not sure where they're from. Have you heard of a trusted company? Mm -mm. I've heard of it. I think it's is it Australia. Yeah, is it? yeah. I, I think it's regional. Uh, if I'm mistaken. So like you see certain websites, they have a little badge at the bottom called trusted company. Yeah. It does kind of the same thing as Scambook, but in less of an abrasive fashion, So it's yeah. not like it's not there to shame you, but it's there to kind of establish whether or not your brand is strong with like a five-star rating and if anything drops the rating then you go and resolve the issue wow. similar kind of logic but it's just branded yeah. and positioned differently yeah interesting i think that that's quite legit i've seen them yeah because they kind of give you like a third-party validation yeah exactly say so, whether you're a legit yeah. business or it, it's like those you know last time e-commerce sites used to have that badges down there right yeah to show that you're safe that you know you oh. can get refund blah 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 uh, so like, like i mean i like i like what you're saying as well about like the idea of cloning or rather copying an existing business, right? And so I, I remember when we started firstly, um, the original version of it was a trip planner, right? Mm -hmm. Trip planner that you could book. And we, there wasn't anything like that in the market. And I, I was talking to quite a reputable VC. And this VC literally told me on the call, Aaron, uh, it's a cool idea, man, but you know, VCs in this part of the world, what they look for is a template. Like if you can say that this is like this in the US, then they're more likely to invest in you. If it comes with something completely unique, they won't give you money. Yeah. It made me kind of sad when I heard that at, at the point that like why aren't we rewarding innovation? But yeah. I guess 
time gives you time to think about it as well and a like distance to think about it i mean when we started new runner we were we were a clone of postmates you know yeah. I mean, it's yeah. you know it's yeah um what but what you do see like is there are some very interesting more localized innovations right like so like if you look at what's happened in indonesia with some of their companies those are great examples of localized innovation that only can exist in indonesia yeah so i would argue the only way for like a unique business to exist like this that only exists in a specific market is when the market is big enough. Indonesia. Yeah. In, the, in Indonesia's case, it is big enough. It's, yeah. it's as big as the US basically, right? Like one giant homogeneous country uh, with lots of upside where they can, they're all going to digitize over the next couple of years. So under the right trajectory, right? So, and the market is large enough so you can try these sort of things. So like what they did with Kudo, which is uh, and it's now called Grab Kiosk and Marung Pintar, all very Indonesian only solutions, but the market is big enough to sustain innovation. Um, I take your point. I think in many cases in Malaysia, it's very difficult to do unless you're able to go regional instantly. And that's, I think that's a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I like how we started talking about online gurus and then I brought in the tech fellas and that's it. Like we've that's right. Up. And I, and I told in about 20 minutes, uh, now it's one and a half bloody hours. La. I oh, knew it was not going to be 20 minutes. That's why I sent my kids to sleep first. Eh? <laughs> I, I was like, let's keep this short and sweet because I'm not trying to bore anyone. It's a Monday night. Eh? But I guess the beauty of MCO is uh, it could be Saturday for all we care. It's Tuesday night. It's Tuesday, John. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my case is boring. <laughs> Oh. No, but since we're talking about scam, right, I just want to share one uh, very news. I don't know whether it's a new scam, but this is the first time. I mean, I, I know about a lot of scams, so this is something new to me. So someone emailed me uh, to my business email and said they will he'll send me 50 leads for mobile app development from US, right, for a flat fee of 1,000 US dollars. Uh, so it sounded shady. La, so I said, okay. I replied and said, okay, go, sure, go ahead. And the email said, you will only pay me the 1,000 US dollars after I've given you the lead. And once you close at least one sale, sounds very legit, right? I don't have to pay anything up front. I said, okay, sure, go ahead, let's go. So the reply came and said, okay, so uh, I'll send you this 50 lead. I'm ready to send it to you now. Uh, but what guarantee do I get that you'll pay me after that? So I'm like, dude, you came to me. I didn't come to you, right? You want to give me the leads? Give me the leads. Uh, so then another email came. Yeah, but you know, I can give you this lease, 50 leads from US. You'll make a lot of money. But after that, what if you don't pay me? So that's a scam, right? I think a lot of people, if they are desperate and they are greedy, they would have been like, okay, okay, I'll pay you first. Uh, you give me the 50 leads, don't worry, I'll close it myself. Very simple scam. I think a lot of people will fall for it. They will easily, even if they don't pay that thousand US dollars, they might go like, hey, uh, I'll pay you 100 ringgit first, or I'll pay you 500 ringgit first, uh, mm. just to show that I'm, you know, I'm genuine. Yeah. Uh, so give me the 50 leads, right? That's a scam, such it a just, simple scam. Yeah, it just struck me like some of these, um... I mean, don't want to call them out straight up, but these internet gurus are equivalent to the African generals of our time. <laughs> <laughs> King Jeffy Jaffa's third son twice departed, left you 50 million, you know, so you got to transfer the money up front. Now, I mean, people fell for that, right? There were people who actually fell for that when internet came online, when Hotmail and Yahoo accounts just first came online. There were people who fell for that, you know? So, 419 scams yeah 419 scams exactly you know and so you know i, once, I used to be a big fan of 419eater.com <laughs> i once attended a, a, a cyber security talk by f secure right it's a finnish yeah. uh, you know security company right i launched and, F Secure malaysia i did their launch here oh right okay really yeah. in, uh, my, in bangsa south yeah my former client we did some uh, design work for them <laughs> that's crazy yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. the F -Secure, F -Secure. I, I had some friends who worked there yeah this is back in the day for uh, when Bangsa South first opened. They are, yeah, yeah. We're back in the day. Yeah. yeah. So and I, and I and we talked about they were talking they were doing a whole presentation on um, on spam email right mm. and uh, you know those things you get you know like and here's the here's the crazy thing the crazy stat that they had inside that they shared was that um, the click rate the open rate like open email rate is forty percent you know that means forty percent of those emails that get sent out actually get clicked and opened. Wow. So, wow. you know, it's, uh, it's, and, and this was not long ago. This was, I mean, it was not the early 2000s. This was in fact like, in the last, within the last 10 years. Obviously, I'm sure the number is much lower now. Yeah. But you would have expected even 10 years ago, really, can the number be that high? I mean, who opens this stuff, right? But 
a lot of people open a lot of my clients I mean, open these scams if, and then if, they'll they'll message me <laughs> if only they could use these powers for good and launch a course about how to do effective email marketing yeah, yeah but, uh, it's much easier to uh, i think I, fear tactics yeah right. i think i think fear more, of, more. Fear of missing out you see the you see the legitimate scam, the ones that are so obvious you see it coming a mile away it's the gray areas in the middle the ones who are you know and like like i said i have nothing against people who are you know making making an honest living even if you're not making an entirely honest living but it's you know nobody has to be a do gooder you know you want to dress up your product a bit that's fine but yeah. um i think if you you know because it, it's how much money lie i can tell you if i had to pay if i had to pay 7000 to some training thing i'd be ouch lie you know like mm. like yeah you know, yeah in full you know so that's uh I was shocked like, to see that, that that there is there are those um, you know north of four or five thousand. I was quite shocked to see that there were such training programs around. Yeah. I had never heard of them before. Yeah, it so means their Facebook marketing is very tight, like because they're not targeting me, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, but um, no. But to me, as an entrepreneur in Malaysia, right, we're quite spoiled. I mean, like we said, the the government support is always there. So even if you can't afford to go for this training there's always some program by mdag by magic by cradle or some of these agencies yeah. there's so many programs available and most of them are free you don't have to pay a cent they'll even give you food <laughs> so you know for entrepreneurs in malaysia sometimes i feel like 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 arvind says it's very sad when people get scammed like this and they end up losing money to people who don't have substance when you can easily go and attend a program at magic or even attend an incubator or accelerator or some kind of boot camp and you get way more substance from that may even get funded in the end you know but you so. know inba you're mentioned what you guys are talking about is really the the tech world entrepreneurs you know the old school entrepreneurs or the everyday businesses you're not going to hear of mdeck they don't hear of mdeck in their circles they don't hear of you must understand that as well because you guys are coming from a tech background i'm coming from an external background and of course uh, uh yeah. aaron came from that and then he went to this but the point is for that those are the circles uh, of the today's generation of entrepreneurs or technopreneurs as i call you all but in reality outside of that they're not getting a lot of help you know the yeah, yeah. The, the you know the the regular i mean regular smes the, the traditional entrepreneurship there aren't many legitimate you know sort of like i oh, i don't nothing not even I mean, no, they're still paying money to learn PowerPoint, uh, mm. Excel. Te technically, I think like Magic is trying to move in this direction, right? To be an entrepreneurial development agency, yeah. Yeah. not a tech entrepreneur development agency. It started that way, but mm. I think they've kind of moved in. Like, they're moving in a new direction now, where they're like trying to be more broader and yeah. doesn't matter what kind of entrepreneurship, but you know, so long as entrepreneurship, they want to support you. Um, and I think that's important good. because tech is a huge part of any new business you're going to start. That's right. So right. it makes sense. I think post MCO, every business is going to be tech, man. I mean, nasi lemak delivery has to be online. So <laughs> I think you now they can't run away. The, the regular mom and pop shops now have to go on some kind of delivery platform. So they have to have some kind of gadgets now. I mean, so it, I think everybody is forced to do this whole digital transformation, right? Case in point, so it's I had very some, interesting. I had some friends who were about to open a restaurant uh, pre MCO, and now they're churning out uh, just central kitchen and delivery, right? And they are literally not sure if they have to go back to the original plan anymore, because yeah. all you need is a central kitchen and an extensive delivery network and, and your food is still out there in the hands of people. Yeah. You know, so, so, here's, so here's the interesting thing. You're absolutely, you know, Jiggy, you're spot on, right? It, now is the time, we, uh, Aaron, you talked earlier about how 2008, you know, the Ubers and the Airbnbs all came out of that, right? They came out of that because they were either they were new, newly formed startup or they mm -hmm. pivoted during that period of time to completely change their business model, take advantage of the status quo after the Great Recession. You know, like people needed to make money. People were a bit desperate. So finally, because people were so desperate, they're willing to let a stranger sleep in their room. Hence, you have Airbnb. I mean, that's been widely attributed as to why Airbnb, it was timing, right? Same with Uber. Why would you let a stranger get in the back seat of your car? Because, you know, unemployment, you need to make money, right? So coming now, if a restaurant is willing to shut down its restaurant and become purely cloud-based, that means you cook in a cloud kitchen and you use a delivery network like what you're suggesting, then that's going to make money. That, but if you're trying to be a brick and mortar restaurant where you got some seats, you're paying rent, and then you want to do delivery as well, I think it's the in between that's going to that's going to suffer. I have a different viewpoint about this MCO thing. I think I think the restaurants uh, they are 
not happy about paying 30% of their margins to, to, to grab across the board. I think the moment people, and I, I think people forget, like, eventually after one year, there's a vaccine, you know, no more rebounds. People will go back. It's the human condition, right? We like to go to a restaurant and sit there and eat and, you know, socialize. And the moment these restaurants can get off the grab, get off the platforms to do more of their business, I think they will. I think that depends on how long this lasts, actually. Mm. So if, even let's just say MCO ends after Raya, let's just say, right? Mm. We don't know. But let's just say it does. It doesn't seem to me that we're going to go back to back to March 17th or 16th. It'll, or take, some time. It'll take months. It's, be, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not just like in Malaysia, but also like, Remember, other countries aren't doing as well in the in the handling of the virus, and I mean, other countries are doing quite poorly as well in some cases. And so, travel will be restricted. Uh, certain, kind, you know, we'll probably walk around with masks for a while just to be kind of careful about that. Um, we're, we're gonna have this kind of new reality sinking in. So, the longer this new kind of living condition sustains, the longer we as a society will have to kind of change our habits. So like, and the more we realize, like, I'm just like, just think about the future of work, right? Like, how many people are going to go back, and how many, like, office owners or bosses are going to go back and say, why do I need an office to begin with? Everybody's working at home, like, why pay for my rental? You know, like, I'm already thinking like, the next company I start, like, I'm just going to use the office like a giant lounge, like a giant lounge with a couple of meeting rooms. Everybody's work from home, come every Monday for meeting, then ciao, I don't see you anymore. Yeah, there goes yeah. work sharing space, right? The same thing. Is there yes. for that even? Yeah. yeah. So I think it yeah. depends on, you know, yeah. how everyone changes as well. Because I mean, initially, that's how I started my business, right? Work from home, yeah. my entire team work from home. But then eventually I realized I'm not getting a lot of big projects because clients wanted to have an office. Yeah. So the very reason why I had to get an office is because of my clients, not yeah. because it's, it, it was never a need for me. I mean, even now, as you can see, I'm sitting in my home office, right? Mm. Uh, this I always work from my home office, so working during the MCO is not really a big problem for me. Uh, it's just mm. that businesses are not running, so that's the problem. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. you know, working remotely and all that, it's been done all over the world. That's, I think it's, especially for the tech people, I think it's, it's nothing new. We've done that for a long time. But it's just that the overall business community, how they accept it. If you know next year everything goes back to normal, I think people will start looking at the office because a lot of you know big clients even do the office visit. You no, know, before you sign that big contract, they do that office visit. They want to see whether you actually have staff, you actually have a team in house, or you're just a, a broker who's outsourcing project. People do that, right? A lot of clients do that. Uh, they drop by your mm -hmm. office and all that. So if things go back to that, then yeah, everybody will start getting an office again. <laughs> but I think yeah. at the moment we kind of uh, we can always continue doing work I mean, like this working remotely i think that i think so i think like just the longer this goes on the more people will sink into the new routines and like the, the like the new the longer people will just be more comfortable ordering in from the house and people are more kind of living with their actual families you know like this kind of routines are going to sink in to be more like more commonplace and then it's going to be harder to switch back to the way things were before we'll hit something in the middle of like now and mco right so yeah. Uh, so I think I think that's uh, that's going to be the new and and I guess that determines how this your friend of yours will make decisions for their business, right? Any other business moving forward, right? Whether or not they will have uh, an actual premise or an actual restaurant. Um, the other day I was making pizza with my kids, right? And I was like, man, how can I put this on Grab? <laughs> like, and, and sell this stuff? Maybe I can make some money just selling pizzas in the house. Um, and and actually, the longer this goes on. I think we're going to see lots of competition with Grab. Because we're already seeing it, like StoreHub launched Beep it, right? Like, and that's like a much lower like rate of charge to charge the restaurants. And I, I've seen a few lately that are going direct from the restaurants to the consumer with a much lower rate rather than 30%. And I think we're going to see a lot more competition in the space because now there's a huge opportunity and you'll see more and more platforms just like popping up, servicing this, this issue. Mm. Um, I don't think Grab is going to conquer the market for everyone. I don't think people are going to be paying 30% to send their food to their customers. I don't think it's going to be forever. I think, I think entrepreneurs have to kind of figure out what works best for them. Yeah. There's not, you know, not every business can just work from a screen like this, right? I mean, mm -hmm. even personally for me, uh, running an agency, sitting with graphic designers, content writers, you know, video guys, uh, sometimes working remotely is not as productive. Mm -hmm. You can do it if you really have to do it. But if I had a choice, I want to sit in the office with my team. 
I may mm. not like to sit in the office. I want to go out. I want to you know spend more time with my family, but I also meet clients and all that. Right? That's my role. Yeah. But I would prefer my team to be in the office, sitting together, cracking their heads, and you know come up with something good. And I can always drop in the office and sit with them and go through the work. But like now working remotely, it's, it's very challenging. I can still do the work, but I feel like mm. we are not as productive. Even for a restaurant, right? You can deliver online, but you can't mm. run a restaurant from home. Mm. You still have to come together physically to a restaurant or your central kitchen. And still work together. Probably find ways to do your social distancing or whatever, uh, food safety and all that. For the next few months, it's still going to be very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you still have to come together to a physical space and and still cook your food and deliver, right? So it, it just working from home, remote. It, it's not a template for everyone. So you have to find what's best for your business and how best you can be productive. I think that's that's very important. I think so. It, it's it's going to be a very interesting uh, scene. The next few months is going to be very interesting to see how all these businesses adapt and different industries adapt to this whole post uh, MCO situation. You know what's been the catchword of the entire MCO? Mm. The one word I've heard used like hotcakes, lah. But the new normal? <laughs> no, no, that one all. But there's one word, lah. Uh, and you jokers, it's your lingo. For me, it's uh, I, I'm I'm getting into this this industry, lah. Of what is this one word? I got to do a freaking quiz session now, and one of you all gets to win a free free meal from Grab or something. Just this one word, like, I've never, I myself haven't used this word this much in my life. And every Tom Dick and Harry I speak to is using that word, like, or this but word. Zoom, no, not, okay. <laughs> well, Zoom could have been one of it. Top ten words of MCO. Okay, okay. I, I've had two guesses, other guys. <laughs> Come on, Arvin. Here's a quiz for you, lads. For you, lads. Oh, yeah. It's just one word. And it's a, it's on everybody's lips now. At least for those who are still uh, fired up and 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 in tune with with just work and all of what we're doing, whatever it is that we do. Come on, remote, close, but work from home. <laughs> oh, it's all related. But this one word, I mean, I hear it almost every bloody day, which I never heard before for a long time. I mean, it's not a word that was commonly used, not in my circles, we all obviously use it in your circles, but now it's become the layman's term. La. What is it? Come on, y'all actually giving up? You're giving me in suspense. La. Yes. Seriously? Because we're probably used to it, so it's not popping up. <laughs> <laughs> it's pivot. Everyone is talking oh, about yeah. pivot here, pivot there, pivot, 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 pivot. 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 I, I just thought about it, but I, I don't. I I didn't really see it among my non-techie friends that much. You see so what I, I didn't. I didn't I, know whether it's that prevalent. Yeah, so I don't come from the tech world. I mean, the closest fellow yeah. who feeds me tech is I'm looking at him on camera now, Aaron. You know, <laughs> so um, it's like every Tom, Dick, and Harry now is using the word. Uh, there, who's this fellow? Joshua Lim, work for home. No, I mean all of that. Yes, but pivot. I mean, even Mark Darren Lee earlier up was like, this is the perfect time to pivot. And mm-hmm. and yesterday I I did a post on my IG. And uh, a professor from a university, obviously, is a good friend. So, what's your game plan? What's your pivot? I said, D, really, what kind of? You're not a tech fan. Mm-hmm. You teach PR <laughs> and event management. What pivot? So, it's like the last people on the planet I expect to use the word are using it, and it's it's ironic because I'm a mountain biker, and it's actually a very high end brand. Pivot is actually a very expensive brand of mountain biking. <laughs> yeah, but I think you know, in the business world, the words like survive adapt has always been there mm. this is a uh, pivot is a bit cooler used in the tech space yeah so if everyone uses it now i guess it's also easier to explain to people uh, because sometimes when you talk to non techy people you use certain jargons they don't understand so it's good that you know more people are the, familiar the, with the term the reason <laughs> i suspect if you just look at the meaning of the word itself it's this obsession with startups and speed right so and frankly, I I 50-50 on speed. I think sometimes you need speed in a startup, but sometimes you also need to be, you know, but that's a that's another that's a topic for another time, right? But mm-hmm. when you talk about adapt, there's a sense that it might, you know, you adapt uh, gradually, right? Uh, because startups, you know, the speed of execution, speed of decision making is immediate. Even is a sudden change, line, you know? like the ability to change so, your model so quickly, right? Um, I'm not terribly convinced, but you know, but um, about about this whole need to pivot, as in so quickly, you know. Understand, but but here's my next question, which you kind of answered it, but not not fully. So, how did the word pivot originate within the tech circles? Does any one of y'all know, like who started? It's from, um, yeah, it's from Lean Startup Methodology. It's Steve Blank and uh, you know, 
and uh, Eric Reese, right? So um, it, it started from those two guys. Uh, Eric Reese adapted Steve Blank's uh, uh, startup manual into Lean Startup. And you start, um, when you start a new, when you start a, when, when you start a tech startup, your business model is uncertain. So if you start a restaurant, business model is very simple. Get rent, pay rent, you know, cook something. People come in, they sit down, you feed them, you get out. How you make money is very easy. But when you're starting a new business like Uber, it's a new business model that's really not been tested before. You don't know whether it's going to work. So you test, right? But the thing about testing is when you test and you realize that what you thought doesn't work, you've got to pivot. That means you've got to change your business model to something else, test again. And if that doesn't work, you've got to pivot right and change again so you got to change and change and change until this startup finds a business model that is that works when did this book come online arvin oh, 10 years ago years ago 2009 around the time of the 2008 uh, recession it was sorry what's the name of the book so let me just put it out there for people the, the lean startup the lean startup it was published in 2011 2011 yeah okay. yeah okay. it was uh, so, launching a startup is basically a huge experiment yeah that's what it is right experimenting a business model experimenting a solution when you have a problem and then you have to experiment 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 and pivot until you get the best solution so that's why you know the te tech startup guys are very familiar with this term uh maybe the non-techie people may not be that yeah and, familiar and with the actually, concept. Yeah, it's quite interesting it's like building these startups are a science right so this lean startup turns it into it is like the curriculum for the science right so it turns out that you know like if you're a, if you invest in a pre-seed startup, like a very early stage startup, you're not giving me money to make money. You're giving me money to I have an idea. I think it may work, but literally you're giving me money to build a system that tests this idea in the earlier stage. That's the pure science of it, lah. But try right. telling an investor that, like, that's not easy to do. <laughs> and it's like, oh, in you know the investors I talk to, if I invest hundred thousand, I want to make a million. I say, yeah, you will, but you might also lose the hundred thousand, lah. You know. Right. Um, so so yeah that's that's where pivot came from la, but but yes it is, it is highly overused uh you are not wrong it is at least in the top three most used words right interesting so, uh aaron what's been your key uh, learning points during mco mm -hmm. and i'm going to ask all of you all this okay uh yeah and, and maybe after this i'm gonna probably have to leave guys yeah, so, yeah we're all leaving uh, after this okay, okay. <laughs> um <laughs> So I think Ali question. <laughs> so so um, when the MCO started, um, uh, the guys from Web and Travel reached out to me. So Web and Travel is a publication, like an online magazine, and uh, the publisher. Uh, and I go back from my touristy days, and she was very supportive of us back then. Uh, and I also like tend to like make a like a point to like appear at their events and stuff. So they did like an event in just before MCO in March. Uh, I went there for that event and then MCO hit, right? Uh, so when MCO started, she said, hey, can you just write like a, like a short article for us? Like a, you know, like a little blog, community blog piece in solidarity with people in the travel space. And since that is part of my, my background as well, I thought I'd do it. And I guess as uh, in that, that time, right? Like the thing that really hit me was a couple of things, right? Firstly, I, I felt that this moment in the MCO is going to be important, right? Um, I feel like this crisis and this pandemic is impacting society in a way that's not happened in many, many years. I think the last time this happened, there was a world war, uh, but never has there been in, in our lifetime something that's impacted the entire planet in such a paralyzing way, right? And so I felt like the things that we do in this moment will be important for how how our future will be after this, right? Mm. Um, the other thing was like just decisions that I would make, right? Like, and I, and I guess you, you guys know I'm I've been doing some consulting work, some some kind of, like an agency, and um, and it, I began to think to myself that maybe there's like there's a need to reprioritize a bit. Like, is this really the right use of my time, or uh, or the projects that I take on? Uh, is this really something I really want to do? Because I think those decisions I think matter and you have to really be thoughtful. So I think it made me very mindful about the moment. It made me mindful about the things I opt to do myself. And then also made me start to think about, okay, where do I want to end up at the end, at the end of this? Like, where does, where, where does MCO take us? And so that's kind of, oh, rather this, this crisis take us. And so that's kind of how it's impacted the way I think about it. Um, I'd like to think it's 
influenced a lot of the decisions we've made over the last couple of weeks as, as, as well. Like uh, we talked about scale up just now, we talked about um, the decision to invest in the companies and then even to write the recent article that we wrote, uh, it was something that we were just talking about that was necessary and uh, Doc and I said, okay, let's write this piece. And we spent about two weeks writing this, like this went back and forth, knowing that we had other things to do during the day. And then who who knew that when we publish it, we're going to get pretty decent traction for it and people were actually talking about it. So like really like focusing on good work and things that you think will matter, I think will go a long way. Yep. I th and I think now's the time to do it, actually. Yep. If there's ever a time to experiment, now is it. Yeah. Arvin? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, like, I think, I think obviously everything, a lot of things will change, but not in the, not in the way that people, I think people, not in the way that people are going to think, right? Yeah. So for example, if you take, um, if you take malls, for example, shopping malls, right? Yeah. It doesn't take the mall to go to zero for it to go out of business. Mm. If a mall even goes down by 10% or 20%, it's already going to be out of business, right? Because yep. everything was structured on 10 and 20% margins, you know what I mean? So you can't have that kind of, you know, that, 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 that balance is going to be uh, upset. But these are these are big, big parts of our economy right now, right? They're huge parts of our economy. What are you going to, I think the opportunity lies in, what do you do with that? What do you do with malls now? What do you do with restaurants now, right? Mm. Um, I think that's from an entrepreneurship perspective, that's the opportunity. This opportunity comes once every 10, once every 15 years. And that's why from Walt Disney in the 30s to you know FedEx in the 70s, Microsoft in 75, HP, all of these companies, including Uber and all that, right? Mm -hmm. They all came out of the back of recessions one or two years after a, a, a down cycle. And the reason is that only in this time, our businesses, people, are they willing to change their behavior, right? Um, if you were ever doing anything in the work from home space, only now will companies be willing to listen to you, for example, right? So it's these opportunities that we'll see the, the, the people should be looking at. And that's the, and you know, if, if a lot of people are gonna be furloughed or they're gonna be let go, or you know, they're gonna find that they are probably made redundant and it, it, it may happen, may not happen immediately, but after the subsidies run out, it doesn't mean the businesses are gonna automatically survive, you know? Right. So it's gonna happen. This is also a time why entrepreneurship spikes after recessions, because previously, you had really good talent. Uh, you know, this was in the, the time when, uh, you know, Aaron first started, you know, 2014, I think when you started your 2013, 2014, you had all these really, you know, high performing people going into entrepreneurship, but then many of them, uh, you know, eventually got seduced by the dark side. You know, they, they got, as companies wanted to be more entrepreneurial, the company will say, come and work for me. I'll pay you 20,000 a month, 25,000 a month. Nothing wrong with that, but talent gets sucked into corporate. And now it's gonna, you know, in down cycles, it goes back the other way, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's really super interesting to see what's gonna happen in the next one. It will lag, it will not be yeah. immediate, but within yeah. the next six months, yeah. I expect there to be like a bit of a spike up in terms of new new startups and, you know, entrepreneurship. So I think yeah. it's gonna be great. Awesome. Inba, very quickly, and just your take on MCO, what's been your learning curve? Uh, I think now it's all about survival. Yeah, and uh, you know that's that's all we can do right now. But I think looking beyond that, uh, I think it's, as entrepreneurs, you just have to be strong. If you need to pivot, pivot. If you need to adapt, you adapt. Mm. Uh, I think as entrepreneurs, we can't do the same thing that people with a nine to five job expects, right? Yep. You have to lead the way. Yeah. But you know, a thousand entrepreneurs won't come up with a thousand brilliant solutions. There, there'll be always the the thought leaders. Yeah. Uh, the guys who come up with the the amazing solution somewhere, and then there'll always be a group that follows. And there's nothing wrong with that. Entrepreneurs can always follow other great entrepreneurs. Yep. But it's just that, you know, you can't be stagnant. Sure. You, know, you have to be dynamic. So you can't just sit there, give up, and then say, like, okay, you know, that, that's my fate. Yep. As entrepreneurs, either you lead that, you take the lead, you come, you become the thought leader, you come up with a brilliant solution for others to follow, or you follow other great leaders who have come up with something amazing. Sure. Uh, you know, there's, there's always a slice of pie for everyone. Yeah. So I think as entrepreneurs, we can always all progress together. Awesome. So, um, that's my take on it. This is my learning curve, just doing a whole lot of this content for the last one blinking month and, you know, uh, getting a chance to put people. I mean, in reality, where the heck would the four of us sit together at a table and talk like this? That is true. It's not going to happen. 
Well, the three of us will be at found it. Like. Found it. <laughs> I was just about to say that. Okay, me. I, I'm always so, the odd one out here. You have to visit us at found it once all these ends. Uh, so. <laughs> too busy making money. Okay. Right. What are the He's too busy with celebrities. I told him earlier. What, what He's too busy with celebrities in his cars, you know, always hanging out with famous people. So well, it's a bit hard. Now true. we can catch him. That's not true. One year ago, I interviewed this homeboy, okay, and before it was a car issue. Before it was on the car, Aaron was already on my show last year. Uh, yeah, I was in your office, man. <laughs> yeah, show, exactly. yeah. Every time you, every time you gun the car engine, I see your guests, they kind of stiffen a bit, you know, because they're like, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Some of them enjoy it. Some of them enjoy it. But yeah. You know. <laughs> All right, folks, thank you so much for spending your Tuesday, uh, you know, just shooting the breeze. Uh, this is a uh, raw session. And uh, honestly, we kept it super raw. So thank you. I mean, nice. to our unexpected guests, Aaron and then Arvind. I mean, thanks for being good sports. So, <laughs> in. all right. Cool. Thanks, uh, gentlemen. And uh, let's hope everybody got something out of this. So, power up. Right, guys. Take care. Bye bye. See you guys. Bye. See you guys.